Hello everyone. Hello, Hello everyone. Uh, very welcome to this uh, international congress of the Young Professional Network. This is the second day, so I welcome you very much for all the chairs and all the hosts. This session will be based on hydraulic structure and urban drainage. The host will be me, Manuel Quaranta, and Eva Fenrich, while the chairs will be Stefan Felder, Manfred Kleidorfer, and Bruno Huang. I will tell you soon some words about them. But first of all, I would like to say you, if you are a speaker, please raise your hand so that we can identify you and promote you as a panelist. So I am Manuel Quaranta. I am a scientific officer. I work at the European Commission. My main focus is the water energy ecosystem nexus with focus on uh, hydropower and uh, wastewater. Eva, the other uh, co-host, uh, currently works as a senior consultant for air consultancy sustainability. Her main focus at the moment is system thinking and system modeling as well as education for sustainable development. The uh, chairs of the session will be Mr. Uh, Felder, Pedofer, and Duro Hang. Professor Felder is an associate professor in hydraulic engineering and applied flight mechanics at the Water Research Laboratory. He established and leading the hydraulic engineering research group conducting high level fundamental and applied research in large scale experimental facilities. He also uh, worked on air water flow phenomena and optimization of water engineering infrastructure for flow conveyance, fish passage, and environmental flow. Clay Dorfer is a scientist in urban water management, interested in numerical modeling of drainage and supply system, including system analysis, uncertainty, and model calibration. Prof. Juan Duro is associate head, associate professor of the Department of Hydraulic Engineering at Tsinghua University. Her research interests mainly include hydraulic structure and earthquake engineering. She published more than 70 journal papers in mainstream journal and was also granted 24 national patents. Presently, she is editor in chief of the Springer series Hydraulic Science and Engineering. So, some a few words on how to structure this uh, session. Uh, I suggest you again to raise your hand if you have to speak. You have six minutes maximum for your poster presentation. 
I also suggest to stay until the end because at the end there will be the question and answer um, time. We will share your poster so you don't have to share anything unless there are some problems. If you have a question, please write them in the question and answer um, system in the chat. Thank you very much. So now I leave the floor to the co-chairs. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. I've got the honor to uh, chair this first session, the presentations. Um, yeah, as, as introduced, I'm Stefan Felder. I'm from UNSW Sydney in Australia. And uh, I would like to introduce briefly my co-chairs. Um, first, Manfred Kleidorfer. Yes, welcome also from my side. My name is Manfred Kleidorfer, as mentioned, from University Innsbruck in Austria. Um, I'm working in urban drainage and I'm also representing the technical committee uh, on urban drainage, which is an IAHR and uh, IWA joint committee on urban drainage. We are working on, on, on the different fields of urban drainage uh, um, from flood modeling, climate change impact, climate change adaptation, uh, stormwater treatment, pollutants. Um, I will put two links uh, in the chat. So if you are interested in that, uh, committee a bit more have a look and also uh, join us um, I will be mainly then active in the in the questions and answer sessions afterward thank you thank you and I would also like to introduce uh, the second co-chair it's Duro Huang uh, all right. Hello, everyone. I'm Huang Duro from the uh, Department of Hydraulic Engineering at Tsinghua University in China. Uh, so my research, uh, my research pro interest primarily includes seismic analysis of hydraulic structures and new dam construction materials. Uh, so I just uh, uh, leave the space and time for our uh, for our speakers, and I also put my personal um, homepage link uh, in our uh, in, uh, 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 as follows, and we will communicate later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would like to also briefly introduce the technical uh, technical committee on hydraulic structures. I'm current chair of this committee, um, so we are quite an active committee dealing with everything related to hydraulic structures. Um, quite a few presentations will be in this session today on hydraulic structures, but we are dealing with, with a wide range of issues, including uh, fostering a more sustainable future of hydraulic structures. So looking at their contributions. Uh, we are also active in organizing events. And one of the events that uh, fits topic-wise very well is our junior workshop. I've got this on my background here, advertisement. This happens next year in uh, Zurich, and the abstract submission deadline is the 20th of um, January next year. So if, um, if you're interested, I will post the link in the chat as well. All right. And with this, I would like to introduce the first speaker. It's Alicia Ross Berner, who will present on two-dimensional numerical simulation of a sharp-crested free-falling jet in flow 3D. The floor is your, Alicia. Your solution. Are you here, Alicia? Now, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan, for your introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Alicia, and I'm a PhD student at the Universidad Politécnica de Cartagena, Spain. And as you can see on the screen, the, the study that I'm going to present today uh, tries to delve into the, into the hydrodynamics of turbulent rectangular free-falling jets generated by a circuitry weir using, in this case, computational fluid dynamics techniques. To, to do this, uh, the software Flow 3D has been selected to analyze the jet trajectory and the entrained air volume fraction during the fall as a function of the uh, turbulence models. The numerical models uh, are based on uh, physical models whose main characteristics are highlighted here. It consists of an inlet channel with a total length of uh, 4.50 meters and a width of 1.05 meters. 
At the end of this tunnel, a surface distributor is located with the same width and a height of 0 0.33 meters with respect to the bottom of the inlet channel. Also, uh, this weird, the, the weird crest is located at 2.19 meters above the plant's full bottom. With all, those, all this information, um, a numerical, a two-dimensional numerical model has been developed in Flow 3D, uh, in which computational domains has been defined by a mesh size of 0 0.002 meters. Regarding boundary conditions, um, hydrostatic pressure type conditions um, with, a, with a total energy head over the weird crest of 0 0.08 meter has been specified in the inlet. And in the outlet, a free of flow condition has been added. For the turbulence models with different types, types has been implemented, the K omega, the K epsilon, and the renormalization uh, group K epsilon. And besides, an air entrainment models have been selected with a entrainment rate coefficient of 0 0.5 and a bulking option also have been activated. Um, as you can see in figure one, the numerical results of the entrained, entrained air volume fraction are similar when using the RNG KY and KY models. However, the K omega turbulence model suggests that the lower nap of the jet experience, experiences a higher air entrainment, resulting in a non-uniform distribution of the variables across the, the jet width. According to figure two, the numerical results indicate that the point of impact is closer to the spillway than the prediction made by the CMM equation. Nevertheless, the use of the RNGK epsilon and K epsilon turbulence models brings the numerical trajectory closer to the theoretical one. Um, finally, um, to conclude, I would like to express my gratitude for the financial aid uh, obtained from the um, Fundación Cénica de la Región de Murcia. This is all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Alicia. And uh, a reminder for everyone that, um, yeah, we do not have uh, a question and answer session now. Instead, please post your questions in the chat and we will discuss this during the um, yeah the break afterwards where we'll discuss and ask questions to every single presenter today. Um, may, sorry, a, may, yeah. may I just add, and uh, I'll suggest that you also add to, to which presentation you asked the question, maybe presenter or just the number, and this was number one, that, that we can find out who you want to address that later. Well, very good point. Yeah, please, please add the number. So the first presentation was Alicia with, with number one. So number two presentation will be Miguel Antizana, who will be presenting on uh, hybrid modeling to determine the discharge coefficient of a river lateral intake. Miguel, are you there? Uh, yes, hi. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, to everyone for being in this presentation titled Hybrid Modeling to Determine the Discharge Coefficient of a River Lateral Intake. As introduction, the Laboratory of Hydraulics of the Universidad Mayor de San Simón was contracted to determine a relation between the discharge coefficient of a river lateral intake and hydraulic variables nearby its gates by means of a physical modeling. However, due to the physical area and equipment restraints, the laboratory appealed to the hybrid modeling technique to overcome this limitation. As uh, available information, we had a topovolumetry of seven kilometers in length that you can see in figure 1.8 of the Pircomayo River uh, delimited by the sky blue line. Uh, we also had available 40 years of flow measurements at Villamontes station that is in the red dot 
with these two main um, elements, Heredia et al. successfully implemented and calibrated a, a 2D numerical model with the software depth 3D, whose results can be seen in figure 1.b. But those results correspond to the sun nearby the lateral water intake uh, that is marked with a green point. And uh, thanks to these uh, results, uh, we were able to determine that, that the, for the mean flow discharge of the river, uh, the lateral intake will capture water only from a secondary branch of the river. And it was also determined, it was also possible with this numerical model, determine how much uh, flow was going through this secondary branch. So instead of uh, modeling the complete river, we decided to focus only on the, on this secondary branch. And as you can see, it was necessary to cut the grid chamber beyond the lateral intake, but a preliminary model was conducted to verify that the submerged conditions of the gates of the intake were not affected. And in addition, the downstream boundary condition ended up too near to the modeling zone. Um, additionally, five control points that are marked with white uh, were uh, established to measure flow and depth velocities to calibration uh, of the physical model. Um, with the, this uh, sum defined in figure 1.c, you can see the physical model constructed and also the lateral intake. Um, in the figure 1.d, you can see four gates at the downstream boundary conditions that were used to establish different flow depths at uh, at that section to calibrate the model. And in addition, bottom bars that were used to increase the roughness coefficient and correct the flow patterns on the physical model that were not observed in the numerical model. As a result, it's important, well, the calibration was conducted by comparing the flow and depth velocities measured on the physical model with the values produced by the numerical model. As a result, it's important to mention that uh, uh, this technique allows us to reduce the area for, for almost uh, 460 square meters, the area delimited by the red line, to uh, an area of 80 square meters delimited uh, by a green line in figure 1.b. However, due to the closeness of the downstream boundary condition, uh, the circulation phenomenon was detected, and that is why you can see that most of the bottom bars were conducted were, uh, positioned at the lower part of the physical model. Due to this, uh, the circulation phenomenon, the calibration was challenging, but a degree of satisfactory and reasonable was attained. Uh, finally, a parabolic equation that relates the discharge coefficient and the ratio between the gate opening and the flow depth before the gates uh, uh, was uh, determined with a good correlation. As conclusion, it's important to mention that, that this hybrid modeling technique um, allowed us to use the huge amount of data that we had um, in a station far upstream of the study sun. Uh, it also helped us to reduce 88% of the physical modeling area and to overcome the equipment constraints that the laboratory had. And finally, uh, attain the ultimate goal that was determine a practical relation for CD and hydraulic variables. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this presentation, Miguel. And um, with this, I would like to invite the next speaker, Duk Tang Nguyen, uh, presenting on innovative multifunctional flood defense barrier at the Mekong Delta estuaries. Um, are you there? Hello, I um, is the third presenter there. Present on this. Yes, he's here. I promote him as a panelist. Great, thank you. Hello. Oh, is it Hong Sun Trung presenting? Oh, uh, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes. Oh Not... yeah, because it's a little bit strange because uh, I, he cannot join the 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 meeting at uh, he he don't see the mic icon, so he cannot talk. Can you make him like a? Emmanuel, can you can you help or Eva? Can you help, please? Now it should, should be okay. Should work normally. I mean, we send the invitation to be panelist. Yes. So if so he's he panelist, he should be able to talk. Yeah. Otherwise, I can I can I can uh, quick uh, describe of uh, his work. It's okay. Yes, because I'm also one of the author. It's it's better for him to uh, give uh, the presentation, but uh, otherwise I can uh, Probably talk on just behalf now of accept. him. He has just now accept to be panelist. Okay, okay, okay. Thank I you. See. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry about um that problem, and. Um, let me introduce myself. I am Tan and I'm from the Southern Institute of the Squad of Squatter uh, Resource Planning in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And today I will talk for you about our field innovative multifunctional fluid defense barriers at the Mekong Delta Exteriors. And you can see in the presentation that there is some keyword you can search in the Google Mekong Delta, the superfluid barriers, storm search and barriers, operations, short intrusions. Yeah. And um, there, there are four parts I want to solve for you. Then the first, the methods, there are there has been the considerable that they pay over the need to the pure alert network of the substantial private barriers at the major story of the Mekong Delta. This is a measure of the fluid defense and similar to those in the Netherlands. Yeah. This is study provide an overview of the various technological solutions for the bridal barrier structure contractor globally and in Vietnam. And exploring challenges posed by emerging trends in its perception of private barriers within the Mokong Delta. And you can see the figure one, this is the challenge of the construction flow the barrier Mekong Delta. Yeah, and result you can see in the the, the two the picture that's a relations between fraud section and construction cost of the different blur and rival barriers. Yeah, and this is the international, and it's in Vietnam. You can see that it is different. Yeah. And the last one, conclusion, yeah. The superfluid river barrier structured at the major river mode in the Mekong Delta, such as at the Hamflu exterior, if contractors would um, predominantly serve the robots of the fluid reven prevention due to toys similar to the modes we take in Venice, Italy, yeah. Is that these barriers would remain open most of the time of allowing the natural water to the flow, building a water regulation structure that is a more in inactive, partic particular in the difficult economic climate is not ideal, hence, these structures should be designed to provide additional benefits beside their main functions, increase the gate of separations, requested, and the development of the Nepal dress water reservoir would bring the local order, order radius in the Mekong Delta, greater less stability and 
road management and water regulations. Yeah, that's in my medicine station. So um, um thank you for your listen. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, as with all other panelists, uh, please post your questions in the chat below, indicating the number of the talk. Um, with this, I would like to invite the fourth speaker, Merv Okan, who will present on the use of image processing techniques to study evolution of breach at upper part of Earthfill homogeneous dam in comparison with results of Gauss area formula. Uh, Merv, are you there? Yeah, here. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, waiting for the presentation, then I'll start. Okay, uh, my name is Maya Volkan, and uh, I work as a research assistant at Izmir University of Economics. Also, I am a PhD student in Izmir Institute of Technology. Today, uh, I will present you my topic, which is about image processing and let's say Gauss area formula, how we calculate the bridge areas, etc. Let's say actually piping is the, one of the most important causes of earth field dam failure. And let's say actually it causes due to internal erosion. And we know that piping is turning uh, to breaching due to uh, material removed uh, during internal erosion. So here, actually by using those area formula and image processing technique, actually we calculate the bridge areas. So actually, as a first step, what we did, we uh, constructed uh, an earth field dam and homogeneous earth field dam. Let's say here, this dam has a height of uh, 60 centimeter, let's say two meter bottom width and 20 centimeter crest width and with the side slope of one and 1.5. Let's say the soil mixture was consisting of 85% uh, coarse sand and 15% clay uh, and we used 12.5% water content according to fractal test results. Let's say why we prefer this soil mixture because let's say uh, we would like to prevent the seepage from the downstream side because let's say the aim was here creating an initial tunnel and initiate the seepage from this tunnel. Actually, we created this tunnel uh, with a two centimeter diameter under uh, the crest, uh, let's say six centimeter below the crest, then initiated the seepage from here. As a first step, we use the Gauss area formula. Let's say Gauss area formula is used to calculate the area of a polyp. Let's say here what we do, we determine the minimum and maximum um, Okay, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. We selected the minimum and maximum values. Sorry. Sorry, we, we lost you for a sec. Um, are you there again? Uh, uh, actually, I, here I am. I think there is an internet connection problem. Could you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you. Can can you continue? Uh, sorry about that. I am in the university. That's why maybe about the internet connection. Okay. Uh, so let's say I was, I think, in the methods. So let me continue from the methods. As I said before, by using the Gauss area formula, actually what we did, we calculated the bridge area. Here we assign some sufficient number of coordinates, the points, and after, uh, let's say, using these coordinates, let's say by using the coordinates, we calculate the area of the bridge. This was the first step. Then actually what we did by using image processing technique, also we determined the bridge areas. Let's say firstly, actually determine the, uh, let's say, paint the bridge, so let's say the damp surface with green. Why? Let's say because we applied a threshold technique and in threshold technique, what we do, we make some segmentation. Let's say, for example, according to pixels, so that uh, to create a color variety here, create a pixel variety, actually we prefer to apply a green color and uh, on the damp surface as you can see from the uh, figure one, uh, B and C. Let's say then accordingly after uh, applying the green paint, let's say, uh, we applied the thresholding after that time mining a threshold range. Let's say for a range, let's say if our pixel value is in the range, let's say we assigned uh, that pixels as black. We said that 
uh, says with let's say black color. According to actually what we did, we determined the bridge areas in black. It says according to them, at least we know the initial area of the bridge because we created the initial tunnel. Actually, we check how many pixels we have. After checking the pixel numbers, actually we make a rating. We say that okay, this much uh, area should be equal to this much number of pixels. Accordingly, we check time dependent, let's say, bridge areas for let's say other time instance. Then actually, when we check the uh, let's say conclusions that we obtain, actually I can say uh, there is a good agreement between let's say. Uh, those area and image processing technique which we obtained uh, accordingly. And let's say, I can say the visual methods can be used in the determination of, let's say, time demand values of each area in laboratory studies. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, there were a few um, yeah gaps in between with connection issues, but uh, I think we, we could follow quite well. With this, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Kumhur Ospe, who will be presenting on void ratio effects on interception efficiencies of continuous transfer grade inlets. Are you here, Kumhur? Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you very much. Los yes. Is it going to be full screen or okay. that? So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Grosbey, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Civil Engineering Department of Hacettepe University from Turkey. Today, I would like to present a laboratory investigation, which is about the void ratio effect on the interception efficiencies of continuous transverse grade inlets, as the title says. The experimental tests were conducted uh, at the hydraulics laboratory of. Middle East Technical University, and the setup consists of a recirculating rectangular flume of 12 meters long and 0.9 meters wide. Then the longitudinal slope of the channel is constant throughout the experiments, which is 1 over 300, and the cross slope is taken as zero. So basically, at the ninth meter of the channel, a continuous transverse grate is located, representing a water intake structure and serving as a stormwater collection system. And here we have two different flows, the intercepted flow and a bypass flow, which is the flow that is not intercepted by the grate. And there's a discharge channel, which is located right underneath the grate section, and the intercepted flow is conveyed by this discharge channel towards the downstream. And uh, the bypass flow, on the other hand, is maintained as the surface runoff. And then at the downstream end of the channel, both flows make a free fall and they are collected in the pools, they are collected in the tanks. And accordingly, the intercepted and bypassed flow rates are determined uh, by measuring the volumetric water level rise within the tanks in a specific time period. And as a total, six different continuous transverse grades with varying void ratios were tested under different flow rates with respect to their interception efficiencies. And here the void ratio is defined as the total area of the voids divided by the total area of the grade, total area of the grade section, and uh, the range of the tested void ratios in this study is seen here, it is between 36.6%, which is the lowest void ratio, to 52.1%, which corresponds to the highest void ratio. And in figure one below, we can see the bar details of the grades uh, having the lowest void ratio. And within the scope of the study, all the grades have rectangular bar profiles. So six different grades were tested. Uh, the experimental data, if you look at the results, the data reveals uh, basically uh, three main results. First, the hydraulic efficiency or the interception efficiencies of the grades mostly displayed an increasing trend with the total upcoming flow rate, with the total upcoming discharge. So 
this tendency can be seen in figure two as well. Uh, and it's valid for almost all tested void ratios. However, for the second result, after a certain discharge value, after a certain limit, a reduction in the grade efficiency can be observed. And this might be due to the capacity of the inlet itself. And finally, considering all the flow rates here, hydraulic with the most efficient grade was found to be the one having the void ratio of 48.3% as can be seen in figure two here. But actually, it doesn't correspond to the highest void ratio, which is 52.1%. So uh, also a similar tendency can be observed between the first two void ratios. Again, if you look at figure two, uh, the grade having the void ratio of 36.6% displays here, displays a higher efficiency compared to the grade with a slightly higher void ratio, which is 39.6%. So uh, having a higher void ratio doesn't necessarily mean that we will get a higher interception efficiency for the grade. And for the conclusion, the hydraulic efficiencies of the grades were experimentally found to mostly increase with the total flow rates, and the optimal efficiency was found to be the grade with the void ratio of 48.3%, which doesn't correspond to the highest void ratio. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation, Komhor. Very interesting. Um, and with this, I would like to invite the next speaker. It's Ashwini Tivari, Oxygenation at Sharp Crested Weirs. Are you there, Ashwini? Yeah, I can see the name somewhere. Ashwini, can you speak up? I think he's yeah. connecting good, to the good, good good evening. Yeah. Good evening to all of you. Hello. Yeah, Flo there was some Yeah. There was some issue with my laptop, so I'm, I joined with my uh this cell phone. So I'm audible? Yes, you can go ahead. So uh, my name is Ashwin Tiwari and uh, I am pursuing PhD from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. And uh, today I'll be presenting a topic which is aeration performance of rectangular and triangular subcrested via. So uh, the water quality uh, is a major issue uh, which we face uh, which we face nowadays. Like uh, when water is released from uh, hydraulic power plants. And the dissolved oxygen concentration is very low, which is not good for aquatic biota, or there are many point source of pollution in rivers. So we need to address this thing. And uh, we uh, we try to find out that how much is the aeration potential of this uh, weir that is rectangular and triangular subcrested weir. So what we did is uh, we used this flume in our laboratory. Uh, the weir was installed in this flume. And there is a uh, recirculating tank which is connected to this flume so the water is filled in this uh, tank and it was deoxygenated using uh, chemical sodium sulfide and cobaltus chloride and uh, we deoxygenated it to 1 to 2 ppm so that dissolved oxygen concentration does not reach saturation level while uh, performing experiment so uh, there are other researches like uh, one researcher researcher Gulliver et al, et al. He uh, he pointed out that there should be a, a DO deficit of 2.5 mm. So we tried to maintain that. Then the channel is run for a fixed amount of time. And uh, the aeration efficiency was calculated using the equation that is uh, downstream concentration minus upstream concentration over VL and the DO deficit. So this equation comes from the fixed law. Uh, that is uh, uh, diffusion equation that is minus dc by dt is equal to minus scale s cs minus c where we assume that this scale a product remains constant so while uh, integrating this we get this aeration efficiency formula that is formula one uh, equation one which i have mentioned then uh, there is a requirement of temperature correction so in lab uh, while we are conducting experiments the temperature might be different uh, at different different places so it might be 20 degree at some place or 25 degree at some place. So we need to maintain a standard temperature. 
So this uh, empirical formula was, uh, th that is a formula which was given by Gulliver et al. So I use this formula for temperature correction and the recent efficiency of uh, rectangular and triangular surface state wear was uh, obtained. The results show that this aeration efficiency depends upon drop height. So I varied this drop height um, using the gate. So with uh, change in drop height, this aeration efficiency changes. Aeration efficiency increases with increase in drop height. Actually, this uh, aeration uh, is a function of drop height because the impingement velocity that is under root 2gh v is equal to under root 2gh, that is a function of height. So with this change in height, this uh, air entrainment will also change. And uh, so it depends on this drop height. And we also varied this discharge, that is a flow rate per unit width. We varied this and we found out that with uh, increase in discharge, this aeration efficiency increases, uh, which is uh, similar to the experiment conducted by other researcher like Nakasone. Uh, he also did and he found the same trend. So uh, at the end, the conclusion is this aeration efficiency of triangular surface state wear is far better than the aeration efficiency of rectangular surface state wear, which is twice of the rectangular surface state wear. And this aeration efficiency depends upon drop height and uh, flow rate. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your presentation, Ashwini. It was very interesting. Um, so that was our presenter six. Um, now we're coming to presenter number seven or presentation number seven. And I'm calling Yuxuan Chu to present on microplastics discharge from urban drainage system, prominent contribution of sewer overflow pollution. Are you here, Yuxuan? We don't have the poster here, so I'm not sure. Okay, so presenter seven may not be here. Okay, let's um, move on to the next. And uh, if presenter seven turns up in the meantime, we can add the presentation at the very end. So with this, I call Luma Gabriela Fonseca, Fonseca Alves to present on pumps implementation in a Mediterranean city to prevent urban flooding. Are you here, Luma? If there is a speaker that is not yet a panelist, please raise your hand. Is there any other speaker from the from the other authors present to present on behalf of Luma? Okay, so we may do the same and skip this presentation. So if the speaker turns up in the meantime, we um, we um, go back at the very end. And with this, we are already at the ninth presentation or the final presentation in this session. And um, I'm calling Martina Altana to present on urban flood defense strategies, uh, such solution in Querétaro, Mexico. Are you there, uh, Martina? Okay, so we have another missing presenter. Okay, so then another call for the final three presenters in the session. Is anybody there, Martina, on urban flood defense strategies, Luma, um, Alves on ponds implementation in Mediterranean city, or Yukio and Su on microplastics? Either of you here? If not, I, I give another chance. Uh, we move to our coffee break and the discussion. Um, so we will have more questions and more time to, for questions for our other six presenters, if there's interest to discuss. Okay, so the speakers are not here. Then, um, yeah, I would like to pass the microphone to Manfred Kleidorfer to lead the discussion, the Q&A session. Okay, thank you. Yeah, what a pity that the three are missing. Um, but as you said, then we have more time to, for discussions. There are already some questions in the Q and A. Um, so please, if something comes to your mind, um, 
write it down there at the number of the present pre presentation or the, the presenter that you want to address that we know um, who you want to uh, who you want to ask and um, we can start with that with that questions that are already there and 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 after that um, um, I hope new questions are coming in and of course everyone is also invited to just participate in the discussion so we try to do what we now would do in a in a coffee break at the at the conference to 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 stand around and to talk to each other and uh, if you have also if you don't have directly a question uh, but what, have a remark or something uh, working in a similar field um, please uh, please write a few words um it's always nice at pres at, at conferences to to meet people that are working in similar fields and to get the connections so we are also trying to do that even in the in a virtual conference but let's start with the with the with the presentation uh, with the questions um there was one question um by Rafiu um asking i think it was the first no, it was this. It it was not totally clear. Um, the third pre presentation presentation maybe uh, asking, um, can you use your findings towards flood mitigation in a particular lake and uh, or please add whom you w wanted to address? But I I guess it was for the for the third presentation. So the question was, um, could that could that uh, that method or could that work be used? Um, could that findings be, be used towards flood mitigation in a particular wake? Um, Nugen, um, do you want to answer that? I think that was not a question for me. Was it for you? I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. But we asked to the person who wrote this question if we could yeah. specify. I, I, I would the, fit it. I it would fit yeah. to the flood defense barriers. At, yeah. But I'm I I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was for Miguel. I don't know. I also invite all the authors to turn on their video to answer the, the questions. Yes, it's nice to see your faces and to see who we are talking to, that's true. Okay, then skip that for the moment. Um, we have another question um, about the, what is the difference? Why are, why are the variations in Vietnam or the, why the variations in Vietnam are different from uh, that of other international. So I would say this is uh, for the third presentation, at least uh, Mekong Delta is in Vietnam as far as I know. So are there, are there certain are there certain circumstances, especially Vietnam, which is just different from, from, from international boundary conditions? I'm actually not sure if the speaker, the third not speaker. Not here? Is okay. Yeah. Then uh, we have some questions uh, to um, Ashwini. Um, they are still there. Um, why you selected the aeration method rather than other water treatment techniques? Can you explain that, please? And then a follow-up question. Is the aeration technique you selected gra gravitational or other type? This is for Ashwini. Who is still there? So I can see you. Yes, maybe Trang Li would like to say something among the authors. So, 
So Tung Lee, yes, I see your hands raised so you can talk if you want. Please, yes. Can do you uh, do you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, I'm a co-author of the um, paper on the barrier, the large scale barrier in, uh, in Mekong Delta, Vietnam. Okay. So uh, I would like to respond to the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we we have some uh, difficulties, and we also have some. Uh, differences uh, when uh, we uh, propose the uh, last uh, barrier in uh, in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam uh, we we actually now we have uh, seven uh, estuaries with uh, quite large uh, in 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 the in the width of a, of a, to to a normal uh, river it's uh, some place we measure it like 15,000 to 20,000 meter uh, width that it really lasts. So if we uh, apply the normal uh, gap uh, slew or, or, or get, it's, it's, uh, I think it's quite challenging. And uh, another thing is that uh, Vietnam, uh, of course, we are not, uh, not like, um, um, we just, uh, uh, quit the the table of poor countries under underdeveloped uh, country but now now we are now developing but still uh, the the technologies also the investment is quite uh, constrained so it uh, we 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 cannot uh, use uh, like quite uh, advanced uh, techniques uh, like in uh, Italy or in uh, uh, the Netherlands to to apply to the Mekong Delta, so we we have to think uh, a bit uh, differently, to try uh, a solution that fit uh, in our condition, uh, natural condition, also the uh, social economic uh, condition. Yeah, it's uh, very brief, very general, but uh, what what I would like to respond to the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um... I'm here. Ready to answer more. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> um, then there was uh, a question not really related to 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 uh, a specific presentation, and it was maybe it's already answered. But um, someone asked how to subscribe and participate in conferences for precipitation, and, and um, already got the the information about these conferences but uh, for all maybe more are interested um uh so it's it's a great opportunity to meet people to meet people and i i put the i a h r event list uh in the in the in the reply of this uh in of this uh, question and all everyone is invited to look out for an, a conference or an, an event uh, that he or she is interested in check the website uh, typically the procedure is that there is abstract submission this is that you submit an abstract then there is a review of that abstract if it fits to the topic and then you are invited to either present uh, in uh, as a poster or oral presentation or different presentation types so um, i currently can encourage phd student to go to conferences and especially if it's online conferences like this it's easy uh, to participate so a bit uh, a bit on this side also to use that opportunity for, for such an announcement okay um then we have not a, a not a question but we have a remark um from Mamudu, uh, his his or her interest is interested in his interested in in salinity modeling tools or and methodology open source sites. Um, if you want to add something, I don't know if you can talk or if you are if you are among the panelists or not. But maybe. Yes, now at least. 
So do you want to open the microphone and 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 add something to your comment or are you interested in meeting people that work in the same field or in collaborations? maybe not so that this is this is was the comment so far um let me check if we have a question that we did not answer okay the the shwini answered now in the chat do you want to add something to this uh, question to this to the, to your to your answers so do you want to open the microphone or is everything clear okay so these uh question have be answered in hello professor in... okay yes please uh, I answered uh, the question in chat box. Yes, uh, for me it's okay. very, very silent. Very, very. very I, I barely can hear you. Can you speak up? Uh, hello. Uh, now, now, uh, can you hear me? Is it only me? Can the others hear him? For me, it's really, really silent. I can hear him. Okay. Okay, just continue. Uh. Maybe, yeah. Okay, uh, so um, I answered the question in chat box and uh, I just wanted to interact with Professor Stephen Felder. So, um, yeah, uh, he's, uh, he's working in my area. I'm, I'm working in edited flows and uh, he has done uh, research with Professor Chanson in self edited flows. So I just wanted to interact to him and ask that how he does this instrumentation thing? Uh, he uses probe for instrumentation and uh, then find out this air content and a specific interface area and this bubble cord length, all that. So I was also trying to do the same, but uh, I was not getting that uh, how he does that. So if he can answer and uh, he throw some light on that uh, his research techniques, so it will be really beneficial for me. So Professor uh, Felder, uh, can you? We we are reverting. Thank, thanks for your question. We are uh, reverting a bit the question and answer session. I think <laughs> I think we are supposed to ask the question, and, and you are you are clarifying. <laughs> so what what I suggest, uh, Ashwini, can can you send me an email and I point you in the right directions uh, in terms of uh, relevant resources? I'm happy to provide them. Um, can can I jump in with the counter question then? Uh, so yeah, Ashwini, sure, sure, sir. I'm, I'm a big fan of your and Professor Chanson work, so I'll be very happy to interact with you. Yeah. yeah. So a question to you then. So you were presenting reiteration rates of of drop structures. Did you consider? Yes. So you were saying you had to sensor upstream and downstream, and you had a recirculation yes. system, and so did you consider the other? Reiteration components of your flows because you've got more than just your jet, you've got also open channel flows on both ends. How did you consider this in your study? Well, like you were saying, that if there is a bigger model, like that, that is your question. Well, if if you measure your aeration upstream and downstream of your um, of your um, weir overfall. You've got some aeration happening, not just at the weir overfall, but also upstream, downstream. So wherever you've got a free surface or exposure to the free surface, you will have some re-aeration occurring. How did you consider this? Uh, for that, what we can do is uh, we can measure this. Uh, uh, the sample we can take at different, different sections. So the where the jet impinges into the uh, that, uh, that, that pool where it impinges, at that point, and uh, consider uh, one meter, one meter section, and uh, uh, divide the section into one meter, one meter, one meter, and measure at different different section that how much it is getting aerated. So that thing can be done. But for now, uh, for this presentation which I have made, 
I took the water sample at the end of the channel. So it contains the aeration because of that jet nappe also, and because of that, the free uh, flow also, which is going in the channel. So both things are there. Okay. No, that, that's good. But then a comment is just like, you need to then um, differentiate between your various aeration components, because even your open channel flow will contrib uh, contribute to re aeration but not just the jet. For a uh, wide ratio, what I thought that I can use image processing technique. From that, I can found uh, found that bubble, how much bubble is being in trend. But the uh, the probe which you were using, uh, we tried to build a replica of that, but it was not giving a correct reading because uh, 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 what happening was the bubble was coming downward and because of that violent force, it was going upwards. So when the probe was uh, in the direction of that flow, the probe was not able to sense that bubbles. So uh, for that, uh, uh, now I'm working on image processing technique. From that image, I can find out that how much bubble is getting in trend and all that. So that what I was asking that how you use that probe to uh, sense those bubbles. If bubble is mo moving in so much haphazard manner, uh, there is very uncertainty that some bubble is coming from this direction, some from that direction. How uh, How you do that? That was point of my interest. Okay, we, we discussed it offline. As I mentioned, just uh, two sentences. So these are face detection intrusive probes, and they work best if they face in flow direction because they're little needles. If the bubble comes from a different direction, it would hit the needle from behind or from the side, and the probes are not working as well. So that's that's a very short answer to how you would set up those probes. So the probes need to be set up in all directions. That is what you're no, saying. In, in flow direction. In flow direction. Only in flow direction. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I've, I've got plenty of other questions, or, but Manfred might have also some questions or duro um, to other speakers as well. Um, how do you want to proceed? Well, we, we, at the moment, we don't have questions in the Q&A. Uh, again, an invitation if you have one. Um, <laughs> please uh, write it down. And in the meantime, uh, Stefan, please continue. Yeah. All right. I've got a question to Alicia, and it's about scale effects. Um, so you're testing your model with like your, your jet model impinging on the uh, yeah, downstream. You, you are using laboratory data and you're using... Um, a numerical model to look at the laboratory data. So how how do you address scale effects? Uh, yes, uh, Professor, you are right. Uh, there will be a scale effects if we consider field data. So the turbulence will be different in field as compared to lab. So uh, uh, really, uh, uh, it, it is a subject of a study that how things are uh, working in field and how things are in lab. Uh, but uh, for... Uh, for the time being, for this time being, uh, I have not done scale uh, scale effect study, and uh, I'm considering it for doing for the later, uh, because uh, I've just started my PhD. I'm second year, so uh, I'm working on that. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. I, I was actually um, Alicia is doing some very similar research to you, but I don't think she's still here. Um, okay. I've I've got another question to. Um, um, Kumho, who's still there, and I was quite interested, how do you explain physically that you get with increasing void ratio of your um, grades, why you don't, uh, you get less um, efficiency, so there was, and you pointed this quite nicely out, there was some things which, which requires a bit more physical explanation, do you have any idea why you get the, the drop in your efficiency despite increase in voids? This question is for me, so No, it's for Kumhua. Kumhua. Kumhua, Ausbe. Okay, so maybe maybe also no response there. Um, who's who else do we have? We've got. Um, 
Who, who else do we Kumho have? just unmuted, oh. so maybe... Yes. yes. Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Okay, did, did you get uh, hear my question? Uh, I couldn't hear it, sorry. Okay, um, I was I was wondering if you could uh, provide some physical explanation why you get reduced efficiency of your grades with increased void fraction. Um, so this is an example of a special variable uh, in which the discharge, the total flow rate, uh, changes in the streamwise direction, in the flow direction. And uh, basically there are two parameters uh, two non-dimensional parameters are important. The first one is the fruit number, uh, the approach fruit number, and the second one is the void ratio. So uh, this study is about the void ratio. But uh, as you have mentioned, uh, the results revealed that uh, uh, you know getting higher efficiencies uh, is not valid always for the higher void ratios. Maybe uh, this is this result is. Um, Honestly, I, I'm not <laughs> completely sure about the exact physical explanation of this phenomenon, but uh, two times uh, similar observations we made. I mean, in the graphics, we we have seen two times it. Uh, but uh, maybe it depends on the bar spacings and the bar thicknesses. Uh, they are in the game as well. The bar thickness, because uh, I... I have used the two centimeters of bar spacings and 1.5 centimeters and one centimeters of bar spacings uh, and bar thicknesses as well. So the range is two centimeters, 1.5 centimeters and one centimeters. Uh, and according to the results, I can say that the bar thickness and bar spacing, the thickness and the spacing uh, is affecting the results or maybe the uh, I mean, in my opinion, whether it's true or not, I'm not sure as a, I'm not sure, but the quanta effect is also uh, affecting this results, getting higher efficiencies in the lower void ratios uh, because the flow is not very fast. Uh, the discharge, the total flow rate is around one, two, three or four liters per second. So maybe quanta effect is uh, important. Uh, but uh, I know I couldn't answer the question <laughs> exactly, but <laughs> that's all I can say. And I plan to numerically validate the results. I'm going to perform the numerical simulation of this experiment. And I'm hoping to find, I'm hoping to validate the results. Maybe it's going to be different in the numerical simulation. But uh, for now, the only thing I have is the ex experimental results. So, um, that's it. I'm not sure, but I will search it. Yeah, as a, as a comment there, I think that's probably a key question to try to answer in some form. And I'm yes. just wondering when when I was listening to you, you were mentioning you had different sizes of your of your support structures, etc. So it may be just that you've got different loss coefficients. It's kind of like a sequence of different weirs and depending yes. on how your setting is in your upstream head, you get different losses and that affects your overall efficiency. But look, I'm, I'm not an expert in that space, but <laughs> I think that would be quite cool if you if you could come up with a physical explanation. Yes, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to find it. Yeah. Okay, in the meantime, uh, if one of the missing presenters, so the last three, turned up in the meantime, please raise your hand, <laughs> then we, you could still have the opportunity to present. We have a bit um, of a time, a bit, a bit, a bit more time. And, and while we are waiting and searching for presenters, um, we also can uh, answer more questions. Um, are there more? I, I can ask more questions to the other two presenters who are still there. So the, the um, so if I see Murph, is that how you pronounce your name? I think I'm doing it totally wrong. Uh, Murphy Okan? Neither. 
My, my, okay. Merve. <laughs> Thank Merve. you. Okay, apologies. Um, I was I was curious with your presentation. So it's also experimental, etc. So it it goes similar to to other presentations. So if you if you're doing a study at small scale as you've done, how confident will you be to extrapolate your results to a real event? Do you have any prototype data to validate your results with or compare with? Actually, here the aim was not creating a physical model. Actually, just for that scenario, what will happen? Actually, we would like to investigate. Also, by using different soil mixtures or by using different dam dimensions, actually, we could do that. Actually, we had different scenarios. But let's say, as I said before, actually, the aim was not actually directly creating a physical model. But here, actually, at the same time, we are actually uh, making some soil mechanics experiments and uh, checking what is the soil parameters for, let's say, the dam. Uh, soil, according to actually for a numerical, numerical analysis, maybe we can make, a, let's say, validation. Also, we are working on it. So, so it's more about the technique and comparison yes. of physical processes. But could yes. you could you give uh, an estimate or or guess if if your results will be applicable also to larger scale events or structures? Actually, uh, it is a good question. I should say, um, as I said, for it is not a physical model directly. Just as you said, maybe the same uh, experiment with a real physical model by applying a scale maybe as you say can be repeated and again we can check the breaching uh, let's say area accordingly make a comparison as you said but for this case for this scenario actually uh, just under these conditions what we will obtain we would like to check okay yeah thanks thank you Thank you. Stefan, you have more questions? To, to... Well, well, for fairness, I, I haven't asked a question. So, Miguel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, then, uh, so maybe, maybe I ask a question to Miguel as well. So um, I was when I was listening to your presentation, I was actually wondering, um, you were presenting the discharge coefficients of your river lateral intake. So have you um, have you compared your data with other studies? Like um, so, obviously you used your particular uh, setting up your particular case study. Have you looked at theoretical models or other studies to validate? Uh, okay, thank you for the question. Actually, what I have tried to validate was the form of the equation. Uh, I looked for research uh, that uh, used empirical uh, equations, and I just found that uh, the parabolic equation that relates the ratio between different depths were the ones who given uh, the best practical results uh, without getting into uh, scientific uh, um, further explanation of uh, what is the physical phenomenon. Uh, I mean, the purpose was to have a practical equation. Um, and I think that's what uh, we tried to, to find. Okay. Uh, yeah. Miguel, I would have another question, more general one. I'm, I'm from a bit different field, urban drainage, and I've, pay, I've been to the IHR conference in Vienna uh, talking to to, to, to to, to other people's um, more from hydraulics and now you use the hybrid modeling approach so you did both you 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 did numerical modeling and you did physical modeling and and the people there either said oh we don't need uh, physical models anymore or we don't uh, or we we can't use the numerical models we only do physical models you used both uh, could you a bit a bit explain where you see the benefits of, of the both approaches or the limitations what can you only do with a with a with a physical model what, what's not possible in an American model and the other way around could you comment on that a, a, a bit uh, okay well uh, I as I have been able to research well to to look information um, this hybrid modeling allows us to 
uh, increase the efficiency of the physical modeling. I mean, as I showed, reduce the area for modeling uh, certain structures, uh, for example, uh, dams, uh, when you need to model the approach of the flow uh, to a spillway, uh, how much the area that you need to model for uh, the water that is on the dam, uh, to be sure that you are not affecting the flow pattern. Um, that's a, an example of where both models really um, combine together and, and help you to define a good area. Um, also, I, I think that uh, um, numerical models always will need information the, from physical models uh, to, to be better. I mean, um, turbulent models need data fields and physical models help us to, to produce that data. Uh, I think that both are necessary. Uh, uh, well, with time, maybe physical modeling will be needed less, but uh, they will still be necessary. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have more questions, comments? In case not, then I would like to say uh, thank you to all of the presenters that we're here. <laughs> thank you for presenting and uh, thank you for participating into this discussion. Um, I don't know if we lost Stefan. I wanted to... Uh, yeah, would I also to invite all to turn on the screen so that I can take a, a picture. Yes, this is a good idea. We should wait for, yeah, for Stefan. Yes, certainly. I don't know if he lost him. Um, he he disappeared, <laughs> uh, or at least the the, the picture That's disappeared. Wait, uh, two minutes. Yeah. In the meantime, um, I can oh, yeah. I can he's check. Here. Yeah, he is. He's, he's he's here. Okay. In the meantime, we 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 just said we make, we make a. Oh no, he's just connecting to the audience, yeah. so he's not hearing us. Yes, back. Welcome back, Stefan. And <laughs> uh, so we said we want to to make a, a picture. So all, all, please turn on your your camera if you and have smile. one. Yeah, and smile. You can yeah. smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are on. Yes. So I take the picture now. Okay, done. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, the the conference is 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 starting uh, again in ten minutes, depending on your time zone. It's uh, for my time zone. It's uh, two thirty with fluid mechanics, and uh, I hope you will still uh, participate then. And I would like to go give back to to Stefan now. Yeah, thanks very much. My my computer crashed in the meantime, so I'm now joining on my phone. Um, so apologies for this. Um, yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for joining the session. I had uh, I found it really interesting. Thanks for your for your participation. Thanks to the speaker. Thanks to my co-chairs. Um, so I'm looking forward to interacting with you in future and IHR events. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next session we will start in thank minutes. you. I thank you. I invite thank you, thank you. all the speakers of the next session to raise their hands so that we can make them panelists. And thank you very much also to, to Eva for sharing the, the posters and to the chairs of the session and to the speakers. So I hope you can remain here until the, the end and to join also the other sessions. So thank you very much. And yes, the next speaker can start to raise your hand so that we can make you panelist. Goodbye.
Hello. Hello. Hello, Rita. I was trying to, to change my background. It worked. Uh, to include here some advertisement as well because I changed this and I, I cannot find now. Let's see if we have everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fine. It's very soft. It's very pleasant. <laughs> yes, uh, I don't find here the, the comments to, to change the background. I don't know why. Uh, I, you have it, the right one for now. I think yeah. you need to go on your... Yes, but I, I had changed in meanwhile to include here some advertisements of our okay. community. <laughs> so if you go on your icon, there are like three dots on your face on top of the main screen there is your icon with three dots if you if you click on three dots there are first filled with the deactivate and then something about the background yes but like... that's the problem that i don't find this is is changed the <laughs> yeah it's like choose the virtual background i think it should be the correct name in english I I don't think I can. We are streaming. Maybe it's not the best idea to show. <laughs> if you want, you have time to rejoin later, like to try. And when you join to set it, I think you have like five okay. minutes to do it. I think I found. <laughs> or when you go on the lower icon with the video camera you have a small arrow okay. to the top and then you can choose your background as well Okay. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> Perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm searching for speakers. Ma'am, am I supposed to be a panelist? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I got an option. I clicked yes and I was mm -hmm. go pitch and mm -hmm. shall I leave and join? Are you another speaker? Oh yeah, ma'am, I am the speaker. I'm the you first one. Stay. Stay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Please, please stay. Yeah, yeah. But you are yeah. the first one, and then yeah, yeah, yes. Definitely have to stay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. And I need the second one. The second one, no one company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, the second mm -hmm. one is not here. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I'm changing for no company. I'm the second one. Are you the second one? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you are not the first author. I was just checking for the first author. Okay, okay. you are in. And the third one. Then mm -hmm. the so the third one we have. We have James. We have James in. Yeah. Yeah, we have James in. 
And we have Samuel, we have Angel. We almost have Sharifa. <laughs> Sharifa, you need to be promoted as panelist if you want to speak. Good day, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I don't think we are going to start for the even if we have time, so we want, I think it's better to stick to the timeline. Uh, I am going to share the posters for all speakers. So you just need to speak and unmute yourself, like reverse order, of course. Um, I think we are almost there. If you are to speak uh, in the session, fluid mechanics, please raise your hands so that we can promote you as a speaker, as panelist. Okay, uh, I think we can start. Uh, I would thank everyone who connected on time for being here. Uh, we are here at the second session of the fourth YP Congress. The session is titled Fluid Mechanics and the chairs are Claudia Duce and Rita Carvalho. 
Uh, I would now introduce myself. I'm Mariana Varrani. Uh, I'm based in Poland. And uh, a short uh, words on the speakers, uh, on the, sorry, on the chairs. Uh, so Claudia Duce is associate professor of the Department of Engineering at University Roma Tra in Italy. Uh, she started the research with laboratory experiments on sediment transport, later moving to stratified and rotating flows. And in the last few years, she applied larger dissimulation too for the investigation of stratified flow. Within IHR, she's chair of the IHR committee on fluid mechanics at present and member of the editorial board of Journal of Hydraulic Research. As for our second chair, uh, Professor Rita Car Carvalho, uh, Rita is professor at the Civil Engineering Department of the University of Coimbra, Portugal, and researcher at MARE, Marine and Environmental Science Center. Her scientific focus is numerical models coupled with laboratory measurements and experimental work, looking for fluid mechanics details, air entrainment, solid suspension, and structures displacement. Welcome, chairs. Thank you for joining us. Um, I would remind okay. everyone, please, that needs to speak, to please raise your hands so we can add you as panelists. And uh, for those who just listen, enjoy this session. Thank you. I will present all poster myself, so you don't need to do anything else than unmute yourself and present the poster. I'm sharing it. Thank you, Ariane, for the introduction of the session. Yes, we are here uh, at uh, for uh, IHI for the young profession. And the session of quality and and we will have presentation presently, and you will have minutes to present. We will start with the first uh, speaker and we will have an action with the speaker. And I will leave the um, may I stop you a second? Do you have a better mic? Because I really don't have a hard time with hearing it now, Claudia. I'm, I'm. Yeah, it's better now, but we didn't listen very well. Yeah, we. we... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, yes. You must fix your okay. micro. Thank you. Need to. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Um, well, um, just very short. Uh, you will have um, six minutes for your presentation. And now I ask Peter, please, to introduce one of the activities of the full panics family. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Sharing screen now, and I'm going to the first poster if it's fine. May, may I start the presentation? May, may I start? Speak? Yeah, uh, thanks for everyone. I am Gopi Chan. I am from IIT Madras. Uh, I'm from Department of Ocean Engineering. I'm working on the inland waterways, influence of the navigation on the uh, river flows. So our major interest is uh, how the river morphology is changing due to the ship navigation. Uh, so one of the things we want to estimate is the bed shear stress. For that, we want to use the turbulence information. Uh, we search the uh, literature. There are only few works are available. One is Mazunda et al. In, uh, it's a field study. They did with the current meters. After that, uh, Lopez et al., Fernandez et al., 20, 2002. They did ensemble average. They have their own instrument for the shear stress. So we would like to use uh, turbulence information uh, from the velocity data. Uh, we want to have, but the problem is that uh, it's an unsteady flow. As ship moves, the velocity keeps on changing. Usually, we will use Reynolds decomposition to get the turbulence information, turbulence intensities. Uh, for that, uh, your data, velocity data, must be stationary. But ship uh, induced flows are non stationary moreover it's non linear also because uh, as ship moves first due to the change in the obstacle 
assume ship as a obstacle first there will be a drawdown due to bernoulli's principle uh, later there will be secondary flows so uh, before the end of the pri primary wave or the drawdown secondary wave also will come since secondary wave is the faster one so there is a non linearity in formation also usually there are works uh, to decompose the unsteady flow mean velocity um, nezu et al and all used uh, fourier decomposition uh, it's a um, high pass filter you take some frequency cut off above that you assume as the mean velocity higher fluctuations means it is a turbulence information but since it is a non linear data and highly accelerating flows uh, usually it is it was applied for the flood flows where the acceleration is very low the hydro, if you follow the hydrograph but uh, ship uh, induced flows are highly accelerated uh, and uh, F fernandez et al and marcelo garcia from uiuc they particularly stated that this kind of fourier decomposition cannot be used for the navigation induced flows uh, stating this principle and they did the ensemble average so with the recent adve advent of uh, statistical methods such as wavelet analysis and empirical model decomposition uh, we want to try the uh, use this uh, particularly empirical model decomposition information uh, into our flows so we have done experiments at the river confluence we did it's a mobile bed model we have the 90 degrees river confluence and uh, the confluence model is uh, calibrated we, with the literature and uh, with all the fl flows barge is made up of acrylic sheet it's a rectangular barge it has a width of 0.24 uh, meter the flume width is 1.2 meter so barge is 1/5 of the uh, flume model which is uh, uh, to avoid that restricted waterway conditions and it has a length of 1.2 meter which is five times of the width it is uh, in the range of all the available rectangular barges plying in inland waterways throughout the world so at the confluence we have the discharge ratio of 0.8 uh, which is the ratio of the lateral flow means tributary flow to the main flow and barge is moving at a uh, 0.4 times of the u it is moving opposite to the upstream we measured uh, uh, velocities stream wise velocity 3d velocities Uh, using the ldv ldv won't give the continuous information at the constant frequency it works on the bursting mode wherever there is a particle movement is there that information it will be given later we have used the ldv mat developed by uh, ferrera et al and uh, we resampled at the 100 hertz frequency and that we can repeated for 20 times we measured at the same location at the same depth now we have the 20 ensembles now figure 1 is the ensemble average the stream wise velocity here we can see that uh, <clears throat> in the background condition around 0.3 meter per second velocity is there first drawdown will be there the first peak after that there is a continuous uh, secondary waves with very high fluctuations it will, it will be there now uh, five runs and the question number of choice of the runs for the ensembles is uh, debatable uh, usually 20 to 40 chanson per use bore experiments uh, has done 40 experiments but two uh, et al around uh, 2002 he published a work where he showed that five runs would be enough but uh, we also think more uh, runs must be done for now we are presenting here five uh, runs and sample data now we have used uh, uh, we have used uh, an uh, empirical model decomposition it will decompose empirical model decomposition decomposes the signal it can be velocity data or any other data into imfs uh, so it, uh, we have nine imfs and then there is a residual now various summation of the uh, usually higher imfs represents the mean velocity they will have the high wavelengths and low frequency lower uh, imfs are the high frequency modes which represents the turbulence data now what imfs must be summed to get the mean velocity what imfs must be summed to get the uh, turbulence fluctuation is the question now we have tried for that summing up from the uh, 3 to 9 4 to 9 5 to 9 and then 6 to 7 to 9 8 to 9 and then we compared with the literature we found that imf 4 to 9 is the best uh, suitable when compared to the uh, ensemble average data later we have tried wavelet analysis also it decomposes the signal into levels and then again you need to sum of sum the levels to get 
your mean velocity and we have compared with the uh, uh, ensemble average we have tried uh, other uh, methods also like uh, point wise uh, um, interpolation data or moving average data and fourier transform data also compared to all uh, these two methods gave best fit uh, among these two methods emd performed better both captured uh, preliminary wave very well and uh, both are uh, are unable to get uh, are they ha they are having high uncertainty at, at capturing the secondary wave data and now the question emd among overall emd performed better with the r square of 0.91 rmsc of 0.12 compared to the wavelength data uh, further studies must be done uh, or some guidelines must be provided for the choice of the imfs recently nikora et al has used uh, empirical model decomposition to get the large scale uh, and very large scale motions so emd is very useful where there is a non steady non stationarity such as in a unsteady flows and there is a non linear motion non linear wave data uh, thank you thank you for uh, can you hear me ah yes ma'am okay now okay. <laughs> it's better okay uh, thank you for your presentation uh, rita can you go ahead with introducing the second speaker please okay now We'll have uh, uh, Novan Tofani. Uh, sorry. So uh, I, in meanwhile, I I say for, for I motivate the 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 person that are attending to do some questions in the in the question and the answers and please give the name the number of the presentation to to enrich our our discussing in the break. Okay, Novan, are you there? Uh, sorry, uh, I'm ready. Okay, I, uh, the micro is I'm yours. <laughs> Go uh, ahead. Uh, sorry, thank you. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. My name is Mohamed Raja Javanavarati. I am here changing from Novan to Okay, okay. Uh, can you hear me well, first of all? Sorry? Yes, we hear you. You can go. Oh, on. yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Mohamed Raja Javanakalevi. I am an undergraduate student from Republic of Indonesia Division University and Novan Tovani Research Assistant at the National Research and Innovation Agency. Today, I'm going to talk about our preliminary results of our study entitled Towards an Efficient multi phase Flow Model for Impulsive Wave Generation by sub aerial and Flight. Accurate prediction of multi-impulsive wells generated by sub aerial landslide is essential for our understanding to associate impact and risk. To get the accurate result, we use a multi-phase flow model to simulate the sub aerial landslide. As we know, the main problem of simulating a multi-phase flow model is the high comput computational cost needed to get the accurate result. This study aims to add an existing model with a feature called an adaptive mass refinement, uh, that we call IMR, to enhance the computational efficiency and to get the accurate result. We used the Li Huang 2022 model as the base for the simulation. The model incorporates the fourth average nervous stocks equation as the governing equation for the fluid and the sediment phases and is coupled with two phase K min epsilon turbulence model with the particle stress computed with a rheology based model. From the model, and we, we add the feature that is the IMR from Kumar 2019. And, and then we test the model with the IMR using 2D laboratory case of the sub area landslide from Lian Huang 2022 with the setup in figure A. Figure B shows how, the, how the, the IMR works, that is, by refining the mass constructed for the simulation around the cell or the parameter we need. In this case, the wave profile. From the simulation, we get the wave profile for the laboratory case, and then we compare it and to the measured and the simulation result from Lilian Huang. We can see in Figure D that uh, the model using IMR can accurately simulate the wave profile and improve its efficiency by reducing the simulation time by about fifty percent. Of course. Further studies are needed to assess the full potential of the IMR to enhancing the model efficiency. That is all for me. 
Thank you for our meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Novan. Interesting uh, presentation. Um, I remember for the attendees to do some questions in the in the panel. Thank you, Claudia. Do you yeah, go ahead? Yeah. Um, is there the third speaker here, Ben Hong? Or James Salter. No. We have James in the audience, but I do not manage to promote him as panelists. So maybe we can go on. We can and go try on. to recall. Okay, I go later. to the next one. Um, is Samuel? Yeah, here. And then um, now we have the fourth uh, pastor. Experimental and numerical simulations of colliding gravity currents. Hello, thank you very much, Ariana. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, thank you very much, um, Ariana and the chair for this opportunity. My name is uh, Samuel Okbong from Zhejiang University in China. So I'll be presenting few research findings regarding uh, the collision and interaction between counterflowing gravity current. So as a way of introduction, I would like to say that uh, collision and interaction between counterflowing gravity current are common in nature. It has been observed in the atmosphere. It has also been observed in the ocean. In fact, uh, Simpson 1997 stated that uh, sediment deposits on the seafloor provide evidence of a uh, collision between turbidity currents. So recently, some researchers in my reference list here, as you can see, have obtained interesting experimental results, which has made significant contribution to understanding the collision dynamics. However, due to their experimental setup, they admitted that they could not effectively measure the vertical motion of the rising front. So that created a kind of a, a knowledge gap which motivates the present study. So in this study, we combine flow visualization and a PIV experiment to capture the collision dynamics and obtain high resolution velocity fields of the interaction process. We also try to set up numerical simulation to further study the colliding gravity currents. So previous experiments, as I earlier said, acknowledge that their shallow ambient setup introduced potential free surface effects, which limited the maximum rise height of the rising front after the collision. So to overcome these limitations, we adopted a deep ambient setup as shown in figure one, as you can see, maybe partial depth experimental setup as some people will call it. Yeah, so, um, and Shin et al. 2004 confirmed that deep ambient setup is what is obtainable in the natural environment. Chong 2018 also confirmed this. So, uh, as a result, uh, flow visualization, as can be experiments as shown in figure two, a numerical simulation revealed that the outcome of the gravity current collision depends on the buoyancy ratio of the colliding currents. As we can see in figure 2a, symmetric current with the same density as those gravity current that had the same density collided to produce a vertical front. Whereas in figure 2b, which is a symmetric collision, the gravity current with different densities collided at an angle with, with the vertical. Then during a symmetric collision, we observe that the denser blue a gravity current ducted under the less dense yellow gravity current and displaced it from the bottom. So in figure three, we can see that uh, the rising collision front attain maximum vertical velocity at low height, but the velocity decreases as the current approaches maximum uh, rise height. Then our findings also reveal that the maximum rise height, that is the H max of the collision front was okay was twice the height of the colliding current individual current thus 
confirming what was observed in the field by a uh, Henry 1990. So we also observe a strong relationship between the maximum rise height of the collision front and the buoyancy ratio of the colliding current. So since the interaction, the collision and interaction between gravity current is so common in nature, like I said earlier, it has been observed in the atmosphere, it has also been observed in the ocean. So these studies has a widespread implications. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Samuel. Now we'll have uh, Angel uh, speaking about numerical models of a bottom outlet stealing basin without impact element. Are you there, Angel? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we heard you. So yeah. the, the micro is yours. <laughs> uh, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello to everyone. My name is Angel and I work for CEDEX. CEDEX is the Spanish government laboratory of hydraulics that works as a specialized consultancy for the design of hydraulic structures. And in the same way, we carry out research activities. For the development of our work, uh, of the design of the hydraulic uh, structures, we use numerical and physical models. As a 2D model, we use Iber, an Eulerian model that solves the standard equations with a finite Eulerian method. And as a 3D model, we use Experimental, which is the one used in this project. Experimental is a Lagrangian model based on the smooth particle hydrodynamics method. The ESPH method uh, leads to heavier models but it can reproduce the behavior of fluids and the turbulence with accuracy. Now, the physical models, they have a precision of the tenth of the millimeter and are constructed with brick and cement. Although no, nowadays, we are using three winters for special pieces. Now, I'm going to explain one of the projects that we have developed recently, the design of the stellium basin of the bottom outlet of the Lateta Dam. Uh, in figure number one, uh, we can see the design that was uh, submitted by the Water Administration. In the upper image, we can see the numerical model, and in the, uh, in the image of, uh, of them, we can see the, the physical model. The physical model, both physical models, are made in a 125 scale. And in this design, uh, we can see that the dissipation of energy is quite good, and that the flow in the exit of the stealing machine is quite correct. Nevertheless, uh, the design of the intergates uh, is very delicate. And in these cases, uh, in which uh, it is partially flooded, the irrigation is not correct. So the bad irrigation of the bed of the intergates leads uh, to negative pressures and can produce erosions. So we were not sure that uh, this kind of design was uh, the better one. So we tried to find a solution that do not include uh, an impact element and that uh, the radiation is much better. So in figure number two, we can see the different solutions that we have developed with the numerical models, with experimental. In the upper image, we can see the first solution in which we can uh, eliminate the impact element. So we can see that the radiation of the mouth of the pipe is much better, uh, so there are no problems of radiation. But uh, the dissipation of energy is not quite correct, and we can see that there are uh, high velocities in the floor of the basin. We can see that in red is the fluid that has, that has high velocities, and the floor has a lot of area with a red uh, color. So in order to avoid these high velocities and to improve the, the dissipation of energy, we include a little whale uh, one meter high in the floor of the basin. This little element, uh, a simple way, improves significantly the behavior of the, of the basin. We can see that still the mouth of the pipe is correct, correctly aerated. There is a distance of one meter between the mouth and the water, so the aeration is correct. And we can see that the area of the, of the red color is wider. So it represents that the dissipation of energy is better. Also, we can see that the areas with red color are not uh, anymore in the floor of the basin. So there are no high velocities in the floor of the basin. So this design uh, is much better, and we corroborated it with the physical model. 
Uh, so in the end, we came to this, this design that was much better, that uh, ensured the radiation of the mouth and also ensured a good uh, dissipation of energy. As conclusion, I would like to say that uh, numerical models allow to study a wide range of solutions in an easy way. And besides, uh, it is very easy to measure the different parameters, the velocities and the pressures of the fluid. And the visualization of the uh, fluid is much better. A comparison between the physical model and the numerical model. In the physical model, the fluid is uh, transparent or, or white with the bubbles. But in the numerical models with the different colors, with the red color, we can see the areas with high velocities with easiness. And about the physical models, we have to say that they are essential to ensure the results of the numerical models. We will also need numerical models uh, to ensure that the results are correct. And they also give precise data, such as the height of the water level. So uh, both uh, uh, models, numerical models and physical models, complement each other and are needed. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, now we can move to the sixth presentation. Uh, Sharifa Cohen is here. Yeah, I think so. Good morning. Can everyone hear me and see me? Hear you, yes. Yes. But um, we can't see you. See you. Oh, I'm not sure what's happening. We see, we are able only to see the background image. Probably you need to open, open the camera. The camera is open, so I'm not sure. But yeah, we are able to seeing. hear you, then we can start. And uh, even if we are not able to see you. And uh, the next passer is about numerical modeling of hydraulic cramps for pump storage. Please start your presentation. Hi, good morning, everyone. So I'm Sharifa Cohen. I'm representing the IHE Delft Institute for Water Education. Our topic for discussion today is the numerical modeling of hydraulic rams for pump storage. So what exactly is a hydraulic ram and why, why numerical modeling of a hydraulic ram? So in today's society, we are seeing the need for renewable energy and renewable energy storage. And the hydraulic ram is an old device. It's very fascinating in that it requires no external form of energy to operate, but it is still able to harness energy. This energy, what we found fascinating was it could actually harness tidal range energy with just two simple devices. If we go and look at figure one, these two simple devices are the waste valve and the delivery valve. So what happens is that the, hy the hydraulic ram pump, it makes use of a water hammer. So a supply head, water on the falling head accelerates, goes through the waste valve, it reaches a critical acceleration, and then the waste valve suddenly slams shut. This induces a pressure surge within the system, causing the delivery valve to open and water to be pumped. This could be pumped to a, an external reservoir, and energy here could be stored in the form of potential energy. Eventually, energy is dissipated in the system until the waste valve closes again and the entire cycle begins again. So the main two approaches were used to numerically simulate a hydraulic ram. In the first approach, the rigid body water theory as well as the elastic water column theory was used. This was the first approach that used data from the TAC, TAC 1998. It also represented, represented the hydraulic ram as a single downstream boundary node. Approach two was different in the case that the hydraulic ramp pump was simulated as a three-way, three-pipe branching junction, and it only focused on the elastic water column theory or the method of characteristics. In order to validate both approaches, TAC, data, experimental data from TAC was used, so data was simulated, a drive pipe length of 11.9 meters with the wave celerities, as you can see on the poster, a supply head of three meters, a delivery head of 35 meters and a friction factor. We must say that unsteady 
friction was not counted off for either approach. So it was the just steady state friction. When we simulated the data using the Python and MATLAB programming languages, we could see that approach one and approach two, they are similar in what was investigated in the data produced by TAC 1998. However, some deviances could be seen from both, both approaches based on figure two and figure three. While you can see that for the first phase, both figures align completely from both approaches. For the second period, they are out of phase. This can be, this is because for approach two, an assumption was made for instantaneous valve maneuvers. So as soon as backflow was felt at the waste valve, the delivery valve closed, and then the velocity went back to zero or the hydraulic ram started cycling again. So the recoil period is essentially ignored for approach two. But while this is a downside of approach two, approach two gives a flexibility in that difficult or complex valve maneuvers can be modeled using approach two. So I will end in conclusion. A hydraulic ramp pump may be modeled as either a single downstream boundary condition or a three-pipe branching junction. While both, both models were validated using data from TAC 1998, and this data confirmed based on figure three, it was confirmed that numerically a hydraulic ramp pump these models are accurate. Approach two, which includes a recoil phase aligned more closely with theory and the benchmarks period of 0 0.7 seconds. However, approach two has some amount of merit because it relies on a full method of characteristic framework and it offers the potential for complex valve operating conditions for a greater accuracy. Thank you. Sorry that you couldn't see me. I'll try to fix it soon. Okay, thank you, Sharifa. Now we'll move to Canada. Um, Christopher, are you there? Okay, so you appear. Okay, so we'll listen now to characterization of large-scale turbulence horizontal current structures in ice cover flows. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Christopher. I'm from Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. And today I'm bringing the preliminary results on the characterization of large scale turbulence coherent structures uh, under ice cover flows conditions. Um, just as an overview, large scale coherent structures, um, they are defined as the largest conglomeration of eddies with a sense of rotation. They can be of two types, either vertical, if they uh, rotate around the horizontal axis, or horizontal if they rotate around the vertical axis. So in our research, we're focusing pretty much or exclusively on the horizontal ones. Um, despite their relevance in sediment transport, pollutant dispersion, and fluvial configurations, um, these structures remain unexplored in ice cover conditions. So the goal of this, this research is to investigate this gap in to fill this gap and to investigate the scales of the large scale horizontal coherent structures under such conditions. So for this, uh, we run two experiments in a flume that is 11 meters long, 30 centimeters uh, wide and 41 centimeters deep that had a, a flat bed with a, with, um, a piece stone, gravel piece stone with an average grain size of five millimeters and uh, and a uh, and slope approximately of 0 0.002. And then in here, we had two, two different tests. Test number one is the open channel condition, which was a uniform flow of five centimeters. And test number two is the equivalent cover condition. And a cover condition here means uh, we place some simulated ice covers on top, uh, aiming to have the same flow rates and the same slope for both tests. So we took uh, average, it's instantaneous and a time average of flow velocity measurements at 13 different points um, along the center line in the vertical and at 5.5 meters downstream of the entrance with a 2D ADB uh, meter. And the operating um, frequency was 20 hertz and the sampling was for 
120 seconds. So we can see in table number one, our hydraulic conditions for the two tests. So just um, to give a brief uh, definition of the main characteristics we're looking for here is the length scale that represents the streamwise direction of the large scale horizontal coherence structure uh, from the origin to the complete disintegration. And the time scale represents the duration of this journey. So there is an equation proposed uh, by Yali in 1992 that relates the two of them, where the length scale is equal to time scale times the average fault velocity. So to determine these characteristic scales, um, we analyzed the velocity records using two techniques. The first one was the moving average smoothing and the continuous wavelet transform. So in the results section, we can see two sample um, results that we have in there for 2.5 centimeters away from the bed surface. And on figure number one, we can see on the left, uh, the contour plot that represents um, those main frequencies for test number one, which is the uncovered one. So those bright spots that we are seeing in the in the contour plot are the dominant frequencies in, in that signal. And on the lower uh, part of the, on the left-hand side, we have an oscillogram, which is the fluctuations that we have in the velocity measurements. So they are pretty much as a benchmark to double check that we are reading those periods. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have on figure number one, um, test number two, which is the coverage condition. And again, we can see those bright spots, they represent uh, the dominant frequencies. Um, the goal of the GWS, which is the very, um, the plot on the very right side, um, that's the global wavelet spectrum. And those peaks that they are with um, highlighted with circles, are the ones that they are saying what's the intensity of those uh, frequencies that we have in there. So we have in table number two, the dominant frequency components and the time scales that they are for these signals. And as we can see, they vary within the signal. And of course, when we compare them with the other measurements that we took, they change a lot. So to assess the significance of the large scale horizontal coherence structures on river morphology, um, we need to get a value that is representative for the whole condition, which is the average of these scales. So for that, we determine the prob probability density function. That is what we are looking in figure number two. And on the left, we have the uncovered condition. And on the right, we have the covered condition. So from this PDF, what we found is that the time scale for test number one was 11.7 seconds. And for test number two was 11.3 seconds that correspond to average uh, time um, length scales of 8.9 times the flow width for test number one and 7.4 times the flow width for test number two. So in conclusions, uh, what we have is that even though there are like uh, a slight difference in there, uh, this data set was statistically limited. So it's, it's not that significant at the moment. So we concluded that these fin findings are comparable between the two tests, um, suggesting that there is a limited impact because of the ice on the characteristic scales, but we're still working on that to have a more comprehensive data set so we can go further. And what we notice though in this stuff is that the use of the cover reduce a lot the amplitude in the oscillograms as we were looking in figure number one, when we have a cover and the power intensity for the cover condition was extremely reduced. It was in the range of tens, while the the one that it was for the uncovered condition was above 100 values all the time. So yeah, at the moment we're working on like carrying out more tests to actually figure out if if this is something that is really happening or we um, may have like more differences by measuring at different points. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. And now we can move to the next presentation. Is Babich Mirindi here? Yes. Yes, yeah. Okay. And my next presentation is about uh, experimental analysis for transient-based leakage detection in pressurized flows. Yes, so I'll close my camera because I don't trust my network. So, <laughs> okay, so good afternoon, chair members. And scholars, my name is Bovik Merin. I'm currently uh, presenting from the DRC Congo. I'll be giving an overview of my research, my MSc thesis on experimental analysis for transient-based leakage detection in pressurized flow. 
which was conduct at IH Delphin and the Land. So as you know, it's uh, becoming more and more important to find better ways to take care of our water due to urbanization and global climate shift. Globally, uh, water leakage in distribution network poses significant problem, especially small size leaks that run for a long time. This is because traditional passive leak detection method often extended the leakage running time, highlighting the need for advanced approach such as transient based method. So my research, uh, you, know, you know the transient based method are promising technique for leak detection, but uh, require improvements. Hence why we decided to conduct some laboratory experiment so as we can uh, validate them. So the research uh, we use, as you can see on the figure one, on the figure one, we use um, a paprik that was assembled at the IHE Delf laboratory, we, which had an array of, uh, of uh, pressure transducers, but also which, ha oh, sorry, which has an array of pressure transducer that, uh, that, that we were using uh, to, um, to collect data, transient data. And uh, finally, also we use as a study to learn the, signing, the sig signal cross correlation method, which brings a gap between theory and practical implementation. To conduct, so also in parallel, we use also a numerical model on the, on the method of characteristic using Python. The method of characteristic was calibrated to match the experimental condition because the first, uh, the first step was to make sure that the method of characteristic and the experimental data that we are collecting uh, can be overlay, especially for the steady state and also the Joukowsky pressure surge. The cross-correlation analysis method was applied to analyze the pressure the pressure data obtained from the experiment. So by, from the experiment, we had two sets of data. We had first the data, the transient data with the pipe rig with that leak. And also we had other uh, a set of data with, with leak when we were changing, uh, placing the rig, changing some uh, characteristic of the pipe, like the flow, like the location of the rig. But uh, the transient, the transient uh, injection was done when we close the valve, the solenoid valve. And when we overlay uh, the, the two signals, so one with that, the pipe rig, as you can see on the figure two on the left side, and another one with a leak, we could be able to cross correlate those signal and to find the leak locate, the, the, the time where the pressure was damping due to the leak. And having the time where the pressure was damped due to the leak, we could be able to calculate uh, the location of the leak using the simple formula, which is, was the wave celerity multiplied by the, the time where the leak was damped, where the pressure was damped and divided by two. So, the, the results show that the cross-correlation method was highly efficient in, locus, in localizing leaks. And we could be able to get a, to get, because we wanted to show that uh, our method is accurate. So we define what we call a leak, a leak location performance indicator, and which show good results from between one to 4% accuracy. So the study also highlights the importance of uh, considering real world phenomena and computational models, such as fluid structure interaction and unsteady, unsteady state friction, because this will, can allow to have an accurate MOC, a, 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 an accurate model of the, of the system. And uh, so in conclusion, <laughs> the transient based leak detection method using the signal cross correlation technique provide proved to be highly efficient in detecting leak in the experimental public. The study provides a reliable leak localization performance indicator, emphasizes the significant accuracy measurement with celerity, estimating also fr uh, friction factor. So what I mean is, yeah, we know that the, the, the most uh, important uh, parameter that we need to use a cross-correlation technique for for leak location is a wave celerity. So it's very, it's very important to have an accurate uh, wave celerity to apply this method. And also 
is the, uh, because of calibration of the model, the friction factor also needs to be calibrated accurately so we can we can uh, have the look, accurate location of the leak. So the funding of these researches have particular implication for water management system. By integrating this advanced method, we can address urgent leak issues effectively. Thank you for your attention. I hope that uh, this pre presentation give you provide you value inside the research on transient phase leak detection in pressurized flow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bavik. Now we'll move to Italy, Emmanuel Quaranta. He, I already see him here. So he will, he will present power optimization of a very low head double regulated Kaplan turbine for micro hydropower application. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Yeah, thank you very much. I am Emmanuel Quarant. I work at the research center of the European Commission. My main field is um, hydropower. And indeed, now today I will talk about hydropower. Nowadays, there is a great attention, especially in the European Union, at sustainability issues about hydropower. And so to implement strategies that We can hear. There was a problem. Adriana, do you know? He's still online. So I think it has technical issues with the mic. Emanuele. My connection. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we had, you had some connection, problem of connection, uh, so we lose a little bit. In, yeah. In general, no. But uh, I don't we, know why. Yeah, but not perfectly. Sorry, Emanuele, we are not able to hear you properly. Okay. I think you can get rid of can the Can you video. hear me? Yeah. Yes, but not perfect. Mm -hmm. Manuela, can you try to speak again? So to no, yeah, can you hear me? Now it's better. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. Can, you, can you please start again because yeah. we lost most of the yeah. of the uh, so, what you yeah. yeah, please. Okay. I don't know why. So I I put my video turn off so that maybe it's better. I don't know why. And yes, now there is a great attention to develop hydropower in a sustainable way. And one of these strategies could be, for example, to tap heat then hydropower in existing uh, structure and infrastructure, for example, in existing barriers. And this is the case of this presentation. Uh, now, in this presentation, we talk about this Kaplan turbine in an existing barriers and the challenges, the difficulty of building it. I already talked about the problem of sediments of this turbine two years ago at this conference. Today, I will talk about the limitation of spaces in this installation. And indeed, as you can see uh, in the poster, in the second picture, there are not the stay veins of the of the turbine for space availability. And the problem is that uh, the water flow, after uh, flowing in the spiral case, coming back at the inlet, interfering was to uh, install. Uh, a new vein, a new blade at the top of the turbine, as you can see, in order to avoid that the flow at the end of the turbine go and interact with the flow at the inlet. And in this way, we could, uh, with that stay vein, as you can see at the top of the turbine, we can uh, improve uh, the power of 5%. And we did this by computational fluid dynamic simulation. First of all, we uh, validate the results of the um, basic uh, condition. So without the addiction of that stay vein and the computational fluid dynamic simulation, in particular the K 
K-Epsilon RNG model perform very well with an error below uh, 2% on the power. And we can improve the power generation by 5%. So which is the, uh, the key message of this presentation is that the use of standard traditional turbines, like for example, Kaplan turbine, Francis turbine, in very low head application, micro hydropower application could be very challenging because there could be problems, for example, of space, like in this case. And so the use of new turbines, modern turbines, are more uh, indicated for this kind of uh, installation. Uh, so thank you very much, and sorry for the trouble, but I don't know why my connection started to not work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emanuele. And I would like ben to check. Ong. Ben Ong, we yeah. passed him. Yeah, yeah. Is is Ben Ong with us in the session because we can listen to his presentation? No. No, okay. We can skip it. And we are mm -hmm. yeah, we um we already yeah, um we are at the end of the presentation and I think um, I think, Rita, that you can give us any information about uh, the online course that the Fluid Mechanics Committee is organizing. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, so I belong to the Fluid Mechanics uh, Technical Committee and um, in charge of the Cross Committee Action Group. And um, uh, we start to do some conversation with the other committees. And we have now some some projects, one that are in-person schools, like the River Flow that I will be presenting and organized by, by George Constantinatus, and some online school. This online school, the first one will be on lateral cavity, and the, there will be uh, three different options uh, to study the this problem and the, the interface. Uh, so um, we... Um, We'll ha have like uh, six weeks, uh, not all days, of course. Uh, we'll dedicate on Tuesday and Friday uh, for the students have some some theory, some courses, and then they can apply themselves and we can discuss the results. Uh, so you will start in the first week of uh, February, so on 6th, and um, soon that will be um, uh, available all the information uh, that is everything is ready uh, EHR will will spread the information and how to to register to this online school so basically basically we have three options just to study this phenomenon in, uh, numerically uh, or uh, experimentally with the PIV and uh, we have uh, different labors with this study, uh, uh, and uh, we can we can study and uh, discuss some results in the interface. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rita. And um, yeah, we have some some minutes. Uh, we are some minutes in advance, but we can start with a coffee break and uh, with uh, questions for the speakers. Um, I would, I don't know, in the question and answers box, uh, there are no questions because there were two questions, but already answered. Then, um, I don't know if any, any other speaker, um, has any question for the presentations during the session? No one? I can start with my question okay and for the speaker number one for the presentation number one um i would like to have some more details on the velocity measurements you know if copy shot is here copy shot ma'am can you repeat the question sorry yeah the question is uh, can you give some more uh, information about uh, uh, the velocity measurements in your study uh, so we uh, is it about the instrument no? or the sampling frequency or the duration? So we have used the LDV, laser Doppler velocimetry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a 3D LDV, uh, which is a combination of uh, 2D LDV and 1D LDV. Uh, we have used 100 hertz sampling frequency. We collected the data for the 180 seconds. 
Can you? Yes. Yes, thank you. Don't know if you have any question, Rita. Yeah, uh, yes, I, I, I also have this because I could not understand the experimental test based on the abstract and the presentation uh, because you have the 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 flume and we explain some baffles and then you in the poster we you talk about a 90 river confluence and i was um, a little bit confused about that oh okay so it's a river confluence uh, it's a 90 degree river confluence where the lateral channel is joining the main channel at 90 degrees uh, so the widths are varying uh, usually lateral channel will be narrow and main channel will be little wider and the post confluence channel will be much wider uh, due to this uh, uh, large volume of water entering into the post confluence section. So that's why we tried uh, different uh, widths. Water depth was maintained at 13 centimeter. Uh, Reynolds number was around 30,000 and fruit number is around 0.28. So it's subcritical and fully Reynolds number. We have used 0.6 mm D50 uh, sediment. It's a non-uniform uh, sediment. And R star was uh, uh, particle Reynolds number was around uh, 130, which shows that there is a sediment entrainment. And we continued the experiment still, we achieved the equilibrium bed where there is no scour variation of more than one mm per four hours. We continued uh, two more hours to ga guarantee the equilibrium bed. And then we started measuring our plasticity. Thank you. Um, I would move to the presentation, the pasta number two. Um, and uh, don't know if you have any question, Rita, otherwise I work, I can. Um, uh, yes, um, uh, the, I, I found the, the work very interesting. I, I, must, I, I start myself also to study this um, in 2007, I think. Um, and it, it, I think the work is very interesting, but I will wonder if the library will, the 2D AMR, uh, it also available or works with the other um, solvers in open foam or just with the interdime foam? Oh, for the solver, we recreated again because it incorporates the lithium phase foam model. So, we need to recompile it again. Ah, okay. And um, and about the location you choose, the, um, you had some study of uh, preliminary study to locate the the probes. Can you uh, explain it? Uh, the lesson get it what the question was. Um, uh, because um, you you present um, uh, you you present the um, the the study with the uh, the the slope where the um, the landslides fall down and uh, I uh, and you present just two location for the probes uh, and uh, mm -hmm. when I did this experimental in the past I I include like five um, and the um i did like uh, some applied some shebyshev methods to locate to better locate the five and to 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 catch the uh, some special special movement um and i wonder if you locate these two probes uh, what was the criteria to locate them oh, for the two PTR probe uh, we use from the paper itself so the paper is, uh, uses two probes. It, yeah, the paper uses two probes. So we just record it so we can uh, validate our result from the paper. And I have an, a question for you too. Um, my question is, um, uh, for uh, in in the figure that you show with the comparison of the simulation and the experiments performed, um, there is um, um, well the, the agreement um, is better for uh, shorter times than for longer times. Then I would like to know uh, what's the reason for it. Uh, for longer times, uh, uh, 
Uh, there is two. There is two simulation. There is two short tanks and for longer tanks. For longer tanks, we need to incorporate more mesh in it, so it will take more time and it can cause some instability to the uh, solution to the model, so that it can fluctuate better. So it is really better for shorter tanks if we want to use this model. And another question is, um, what's the resolution of your uh, of your grid, the grid that you are using for the simulations? Um, for the resolution is one centimeter by one centimeter. Uh -huh. okay. okay. I don't know if you have any other question, Rita, for him. Or otherwise, we can go ahead with the. Uh, no, uh, there was uh, the question about that, about this numerical instability in the chat, but it's already answered. Yes, I okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, the third pastor was not presented and the author is not here. I had a level of question for this pastor, but yeah, we can All move right. to the fourth pastor. And uh, the speaker is Samuel. Samuel here. Samuel. Yes, I'm here. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question for you. Um, I would like to know, uh, since you are measuring by PAV with uh, gravity currents, then you have different salinity and you have to, uh, you have to uh, match the refractive index. Um, how did you do it? Yeah, uh, to to match the refractive index, we we used um. Ethanol, uh, ethanol to, uh, uh, to 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 mix with the ambient fluid, you know, and then yeah. we try to ensure that the refractive index was uh, was absolutely uh, matched, though it was stressful, but we did that painstakingly so that there was no refraction of the laser beam during the measurements. So we use ethanol. Yeah. Okay, and. Okay. Okay. Um, Samuel, did you uh, use direct numerical simulation on that? Yes, uh, we just uh, set up a two-dimensional numerical simulation. Though we have not really gone deep in that, we just finished experiment, so we, we just have some preliminary results. So we are still on that. So we started with two D simulation, and then when we are done with that, we move on to three D. So we just we are just starting. Simulation. So I'm just showing a few preliminary results on the simulation. Okay. And what dimension did you have the cells? So, two uh, D. Okay. And uh, what's your plan? Uh, because I, is, if I understood well, uh, you performed these two experiments um, with different. Uh, uh, the, the one with the same densities of the two currents, and uh, the second one with different density, or not? Uh, what 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 is um, the future development of this work? Sorry, I don't get you. Yeah, what is uh, what are the future development of the of your work? Uh, what um, which parameter will you vary and? Uh, which quantities will you evaluate in the study? Okay, I uh, we we vary in this one. Uh, we vary the the densities, uh, the buoyancy, and then um I, I think uh, we also uh, vary the Reynolds number on uh, there about. Oh, okay, so uh, in the future experiments, uh, we intend to vary the height. You know at him. Um, Maybe uh, trying to look at uh, uh, the currents with different heights, different height ratio, because that can also be found in the natural environment. So that's the next step we want to move, move into that's to measure the depth, but to vary the depth of the current, different depth. M maybe one is uh, almost twice the other one. So we'll look at depth in the next uh, this, uh, next approach. Okay, thank you. And another question is uh, for the simulations, the DNS simulation, what is the resolution of the model that you applied? 
Hello, sorry. Um, I would like to know the resolution of the model DNS that you, the simulations that you performed. Oh. Internet, I can't hear well. Uh, but can you hear yes, me? The dimension of the cells that was what I asked. Uh, Hello? Hello? Yes, we, we are listening to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I can't. Okay, we can move to the <laughs> to the next speaker, to the next pastor. Okay, Claudia. Uh, ben, no. Yeah. Uh, ben Honson uh, was online. I saw him. Uh, yeah. um, ben Hong is there. Ah, oh, we're missing. Perhaps speaker. he wants to present still. Ah, uh, yes. If don't know, Ariana. Ben Hong, are you ready to yes. talk about your pastor? Yes, I am ready. Ready. You are a bit late, but yeah, <laughs> please. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Hong from Bucknell University. On behalf of my co-author, James Arthur, I would like to present to you our work, The Effect of the Model Vegetation on the Flow Behind the Sudden Drop in Step Application in Tsunami Medications. So this work was motivated by the need to develop systems to mitigate destructive effects of tsunamis. Various structures have been used in the past. However, our focus is on the use of compound defense system, which refers to systems that utilize more than one defense mechanism for such mitigation. So in this work, we seek to explore the utility of using a vegetation barrier behind the sudden drop for this purpose. Given the rareness of such a study in the literature, this literature work provides a unique insight into the underlying flow structures of a turbulent field subjected to these constraints. In this way, we can develop ways to utilize such barriers for moderating high flows from tsunamis. The study was done by carrying out physical laboratory experiment in the flume at Bucknell University. The sudden drop was modeled using plate mounted to form a backward facing step. We also use a set of cylindrical rods to model the forest vegetations. The rods were located behind the backward facing step model and arranged in different ways to enable the study of the effects of various forest layouts in terms of porosity and row numbers. In total, four sets of tests were conducted. The initial three tests were conducted with a medium having 80% porosity. The number of rows of rods was varied with configuration of one row, four rows, and 10 rows. The four tests utilized a medium featuring 95% porosity and incorporated of four rows of rods. A planar particle image velocimetry technique was used to obtain velocities of the three-dimensional open channel turbulent flow past the forest sudden drop in step. Sample results of the work are shown in the poster. They reveal that the compound arrangement results in complex recirculation flow. All step vegetation arrangements have a recirculation bubble upstream of the vegetation rods. However, the extent of major bubbles is reduced with the presence of rods. From our experiment, the 10 rows of rods abated the kinetic energy the most throughout the recirculation region and the modal re vegetation region, eliminating the secondary bubble after the vegetation model. Furthermore, it is clear that the rods or vegetations tends to divert the intensity of turbulent flow so that it is concentrated above the vegetation. This creates region of low energy flow at the step corner and within the modal vegetation, making those potential zones of relief from tsunami. Overall, the data shows that the combination of packing and layout of the vegetation can optimize shielding effectiveness from tsunami. If you guys have any questions, you're welcome to ask. Um, yes, I have one. Since we are in the coffee break, um, how did you define the porosity in your experiments? Porosity models were um, made by 3D printer 
and we we made a hole uh, according to the porosity. For example, ninety five percent had the rows, four rows of holes of total twelve holes, and then. By by decreasing the porosity, we increase the whole numbers of the modal and then put it behind the step. And do you have any question, Rita? You mentioned uh, fruit numbers um, similar to tsunami. What kind of numbers are you talking about? Number of rows, you mean? You, you mean uh, fruit numbers uh, compatible with the tsunamis? I was wondering uh, which fruit numbers did you have? Oh, uh, flow, flow numbers. Flow, so flow fruit number, was, yeah. Yeah, it was 150 liters per minute. That was a max we could go in our flume at Bucknell University. I have another question. Yes. Um, since you were uh, using the laser sheet uh, from 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 the top, uh, my first question is: um, Did you have a very flat uh, water surface? Then, do you have any movement of the laser sheet? And another question is: uh, Don't you have any 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 shadow? Uh, where is where is the laser sheet located? Um, is it crossing? these rods or is just between two rods if i have a look from the from the from the top where is where is it located the laser sheet the the foam the foam the laser is located on the top of the piv yeah and then it's shining on the objects of the flume and the room is perfectly um, covered from the sun, so there is no sunlight coming through, uh, deflecting any deflection reflections, okay. and so there's only laser and a and a room light. Okay, and uh, where is it positioned the laser sheet? Uh, since you have different rods, is not crossing any rod. Is between between it, between them, or not? Not quite getting the questions you, you're saying. Did you have the different plans? Um... The rods were all the same. They were the half of the step height, and they were all located about the 3H, which is 100 millimeters after the step. Only difference was porosity and the number of rods. Yeah, but this figure that you have in uh, figures three, four, five, uh, did you place it in different parts in the um, interval between rods or did you have different plans? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, we So because of the model we made by 3D printer, we could, we could replace those in the flume by after, after testing the figure three test which is test A, we took the model out and then we replaced with test B model. So it's the same flume, but with just different 3D printed models. Okay, but I mean the, the laser sheets, the Cla Claudia was asking, um, the, the laser sheet between the transversal part, you changed the, 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 the rods, but uh, uh, did you compare uh, some uh, velocity fields between uh, different plants? You have a, like not two D because you have separation of rods be, uh, transversely. Um, the results on the poster only shows a turbulent kinetic energy. We do have a velocity um, result in other in our lab. Okay. 
Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And um, we can move to the poster number Angel? five. Yeah, Hangel. Yes, hello. Hello. Um, I would like to ask a question um, about the use of physical model because you have simulations, numerical simulation, you showed us and uh, a, a laboratory experiment of a physical model of this. And did you use the physical model? In which way did you compare uh, the results from the physical model and the numerical simulations? It's a qualitatively comparison or did you measure something? In this, uh, 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 in this case, it is mainly qualitative because this is a, a stealing basin and our main goal is that the energy is uh, properly dissipated. So we, we, we compare this in a visual way. If the flow in the outside of the model, of the physical and the numerical model, the flow is steady. There are no problems in the surface of the flow. So this is a qualitative feature. We have also taken some measures like the phase of the of the water level, but in this case it's kind of a secondary. But in, in other models we take measures, but in, in this one it's more qualitative. Okay. And um, di didn't you vary any hydraulic parameter in the experiments and the simulations, right? Uh, well, uh, we have uh, taken different uh, different scenarios with different uh, water flows. This is the maximal flow with 25 cubic meters per second. And we have tested with uh, lower flows, but the, 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 the energy dissipation is better. And uh, as we have also in the physical model, we have represented the tinctor rate with a 3D printer. We have also taken some scenarios with the tinctor rate uh, partially closed. So to, to see how it is working, how the energy is dissipating, when the gate is partially closed. So we have carried out uh, different scenarios. Thank you. Did you try any uh, C other CFD models rather than the SPH? Uh, no, we work mainly with the SPH method, but uh, we want to, to try to compare the results of this SPH method with other Lurian models, as OpenFOAM, but this is in, in our work. But for, from our experience, SPH gives very good results and for our work is correct. But for some specific scientific purposes, we want to make some comparisons in the future. Okay, so in SPH, you define particle for the water. Uh, and uh, about the air entrainment, do you have an idea what... Um... We do not reproduce uh, their entrainment. We do. We have not developed yet a, a, a several phases model. So we have. Uh, so in the same way, we do not represent the negative pressures, but still uh, it works for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. It was interesting work. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you, and. Um... There are a couple of questions in the question and answers box. I read it. Uh, the first one is for Emanuele. How did you validate your 3D CFT model experimentally? Palmer, which approach you use to optimize? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I compare the power output estimated in the simulation with the power output in the real situation. Uh, or including the efficiency of the generator that is not included in the numerical simulation. So we take into account this. And the error was, uh, if I remember well, 2% on the power output. Uh, then we, uh, in the numerical simulation, try to uh, simulate different optimized configuration by adding different veins in order to direct better the, um, the flow. And what I show in the poster is the final optimized configuration where the power was increased by 5%. We use, uh, I also uh, did the transient simulation in order to compare the differences between the transient simulation and the steady simulation. And the difference was uh, below 0.2%. So at the end, I decided to go with the steady simulation that were faster and more or less with the same accuracy. 
Thank you. We also did a simulation for different uh, mesh sites. And at the end, we choose the, the best compromise. So the mesh sites with the lowest number of elements, but that, give the, that gave the most accurate uh, power prediction, more close to the reality. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank a you. question for Arianna. Uh, we should have some more time or we should stop 10 minutes in advance. It's um, not clear for me. No, we, we can go on up. We can go on. Okay. okay. I would yeah. just, since we are on a break, ask everyone to turn on the camera so that I can take a nice picture of this session. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> and please smile. Okay. Three, two, one, smile. Perfect. Thank you, Arianna. And uh, okay, um, we can move to presentation number six um, to Sharifa. Yes, I'm here. Are you yeah. seeing me now? Okay, yes. great. Oh, yes. Um, I would like to know uh, why there is a time shift in the two simulations that you show us. Okay, so the for approach two, it was strictly the elastic water column theory. So I I assumed so it was so I have some background. So both approaches were done by two MSCs MSC students. So I was approach number two. So in my approach, I assumed instant instantaneous valve maneuvers. So as soon as a backflow was felt at the waist valve, it it closed instantaneously so there was no point of it did not it closed in instantaneously so it did not consider like the the drag from the as you had that negative pressure it went back up to zero instantaneously so it did not have that required period in it as opposed to approach number one so hence the time shifts. Thank you. Is there any question for Sharifa? And uh, I see one hand raised. Sorry. Think Sabar could speak. Okay. Not sure. Okay. Is there any question for Christopher? For the presentation number seven. Christopher, which is the future development of your research? Because you show us uh, these two runs uh, that there is a pre preliminary study with and without a cover. Yeah, so this is a uh, preliminary because we didn't take many measurements. We wanted to check if we were actually able to capture those uh, frequencies in that spectrum. Uh, recently, we have been dealing with open channel with the same flow depth, which is like five centimeters. But instead of having just one single type of cover, we have like different uh, roughness in the boundary to check if there is any effect on the due to the boundary on the uh, large scale horizontal coherent structures. So we already uh, carry out those experiments and we are analyzing the data, trying to like get a more comprehensive uh, picture of like or analysis of what's happening in there. Because initially we took just the measurements of instantaneous velocity in the center line and we are now aiming also or we took the measurements in the whole cross section so we can have a better picture of the entire um flow condition that it's happening there yeah okay. so yeah the idea is later on most probably try to relate this with the sediment transport and and the bed forms that we have in there like probably if we were to have a movable bed to relate these uh, structures with alternate bars, for instance, that they are like large scale ones. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Saber Nashrawi, do you have any? Is there any question from you? No. Well, I think that we can close the session because we are very close to the end of the our time 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 slot. And thank you very much for attending this session of fluid mechanics. Uh, thanks to Ariana for. Uh, Managing the session. Thank you to Rita for co-chairing this session with uh, with me. And um, the following session is uh, about is the session of fluvial hydraulics, and it will start at four p.m. Then, if you want, wish to join the next session, it's yeah starting in a few minutes. Thank you again for attending okay. this session. Thank you to all presenters. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you, Claudia. Thank you, Rita. See you the next time. Next Bye. IHR event. <laughs> Bye. 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 Uh, I would encourage all presenters of the next session, Fluvial Hydraulics, to raise their hands so that we can add them as panelists and please accept the upgrade. Hi, Ariana. Should I leave and uh, as you like, again, or or you depromote me? <laughs> uh, oh, should I depromote you? That sounds good. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay, I, I can. I can. I can. No, but I can modify you as uh, audience. Okay. 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 So I'll do it. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. So bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, I Please, speakers of the session, Pluvial Hydraulics, raise your hands so that we can add you as panelists. Hi, hi, I'm Donatella Termin, I'm chair. Hi, Donatella. I am searching for our speakers and someone has some Hello, hello,
I don't know if we can start or we wait some few minutes. We can wait, I think, two minutes maximum, and then we need to start because we have yeah, yeah. a number of presentations. Okay, I step in. Sorry. Okay, uh, I welcome everyone to this third session of today on fluvial hydraulics. I welcome our chairs, Donatella Termini and Nadia Penna, uh, my co-host Manish Pandey, and I wish all audience have a good time listening to this interesting part of our uh, fourth YP Congress. Um, I will introduce now the chairs and then I leave them the space for chairing the session. So um, one second, uh, I will start with Nadia. So Nadia Penna, he is habilitated research fellow at the University uh, at Università della Calabria in Italy. She received her PhD in hydraulic engineering for the environment and the territory in 2013 from the same university. And since then, she has been working with national and international partners on turbulence in gravel bed and open channel flows turbulence characteristics of vegetated flows, interactions between turbulent flows and structures, statistical characterization of gravel bed roughness structures, and sediment transport and deposition. And then I also welcome Donatella Termini. She is full professor of hydraulics of Department of Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, uh, University of Palermo in Italy. She holds a hydraulic engine, sorry, she holds a PhD uh, in hydraulic engineering from University of Naples, Federico II, and her work focuses on fluvial hydraulics and eco hydraulics, sediment transport, river morphological response, renaturalization, both through experimental investigations and by the development of numerical simulation codes. Besides strict academic role, she is also scientific chief and co founder of SE and LTD and Scientific Chief and Co-Founder Safety Environmental Engineering, SLR, in Italy. That's an academic spin-off of University of Palermo. And with this, I leave the words to our chairs. Thank you for being here together with us. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, a few words uh, only about uh, our um, LTHR uh, committee. Um, I am a member of uh, HR Monograph Task Force and uh, of, um, and a leader team member of uh, Fluvial Hydraulic and, uh, Committee and Eco Hydraulic Committee. Uh, only a few words, to, a few words uh, about this committee. Uh, the first one is uh, HR Fluvial Hydraulics Committee. Um, especially focuses on uh, fluvial processes in river and uh, interaction of water and sediment, uh, both uh, by experimental and uh, numerical investigations. And um, the focus is also on interaction with um, biology, geomorphology, uh, soil mechanics uh, and uh, oceanography. Um, and thus there is a strong interaction uh, between uh, different um, topics. 
Uh, research agenda includes um, uh, not only basic river processes, uh, but also risk uh, analysis and mitigation of fluvial system and uh, renaturalization uh, project. Um, with um, uh, regards to the um, Eco Hydraulic Committee, um, I can say that uh, this committee is um, especially works uh, uh, in the ambit of aquatic ecosystems. And uh, so interaction between uh, water, flora and fauna. And the um, general aims uh, is uh, to bring uh, different specialists uh, together to discuss, compare and uh, evaluate uh, different methods, propose uh, uh, recommendations, suggestions, uh, etc. in this uh, ambit. And uh, working group, uh, different working groups are included uh, and uh, recently uh, fish passes uh, groups uh, and uh, eutrophication uh, in lakes and reservoirs. Uh, These are only a few words about our IHR uh, committee. Uh, so, uh, before to start the session, I asked to, um, uh, Nadia uh, if uh, she would like to add some works, and then uh, we can start. Yeah, thank you, uh, Donatella. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session of uh, fluvial hydraulics of uh, uh, this uh, uh, Congress, the fourth IHR Young Professional Congress. Uh, I'm Nadia Benna, and I'll be uh, chairing or I'll be chairing this session with uh, with Donatella. I would like to thank also Arianna for having introduced me. Um, I'm one of the member of the Fluvial Hydraulics Committee of IHR. So Donatella have already explained the main uh, topic of this um, of this uh, committee. So I think that we can start because we have uh, ten talks. Uh, so it's time, I think. And uh, yeah, Donatella, please you can you can start. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Uh, so we can start and. Uh... Uh, as Nadia says, we have uh, 10 uh, um, uh, talks uh, and uh, we can consider five minutes uh, for each of them and uh, at the end, uh, discussion. Uh, so the first uh, is uh, um, uh, entropy-based two-dimensional velocity distribution for open channel flows. Yes, please. Go on. With Bercenter. Bercenter is here. Probably is not uh, here. So I am promoting him as member. Wait, I think if he accepts. So we can try to 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 go to uh, the second one, and uh, otherwise uh, to the end, uh, probably, yeah. So uh, Nadia, do you want to introduce the second one? Yes, of course. So uh, we can uh, invite the second uh, presenters. Is um... Murali Krishnam Kalindi, Kalidindi and Kosa. Uh, the title of this presentation is uh, Lagrangian Coherent Structures Around Bridge uh, Pier with Skawa Hall. So who is the presenter? Oh, okay, Murali. Yeah. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm presenting on, on my work on Lagrangian coronal structures in the flow around a bridge pier with scour hole. So um, local scouring around a bridge pier is one of the most common reasons for bridge failure. The uh, the flow around a bridge pier include different flow features like uh, 
downflow in front of the pier and the formation of vertex at the bottom of the pier and its extension to the downstream of the pier and the uh, vertex shedding in the downstream of the pier. So all these flow features combined together makes the flow around bridge pier very complex. So uh, to better understand the formation of those cover holes uh, at the bottom of the pier, we need to able to uh, we need to uh, uh, able to extract all these flow features uh, accurately. So previously, many uh, flow techniques used like uh, Q criterion, lambda criterion, like uh, our vorticity, the, uh, uh, these all the techniques that used previously, no, but they have their own uh, disadvantages. So uh, in the present study, uh, we used a new technique called Lagrangian coherence structures to extract the, these flow features uh, around the bridge pier. So coming to the Lagrangian coherence structures, uh, these are the inherent structures in the flow field. Uh, they used to uh, uh, they used to separate the regions with different dynamical behavior and extract the geometry which is often hidden in the velocity field. So and these structures often provide an excellent tool uh, to understand the behavior of time dependent systems. So in order to calculate this uh, uh, Lagrangian coherence structures in the flow around bridge pier, we need the velocity data. To get that, we first did a three-dimensional uh, RAN simulation with the K-Omega turbulence model uh, to simulate the flow around uh, uh, bridge pier with equilibrium scour hole. So the flow domain contains uh, the equilibrium scour hole as well, who, which uh, uh, the dimensions of that equilibrium scour hole are obtained from a, a previous experimental study of Day and Riker 2007. And then the uh, LCS is extracted from the obtained velocity field. So if you see the results, uh, if you see uh, the streamlines in the figure one, uh, a, B, and C. Uh, a is on the uh, symmetry plane, B is on 45 degree angle plane, and C is on 90 degree angle plane. So if we see the stream, uh, streamlines at the upstream symmetry plane in figure uh, in one one in figure one A, we see uh, uh, as the flow approaches the pier, it goes down and forms the vertex at the bottom of the pier, and this vertex uh, is also visible and. 45 degree angle plane and 90 degree angle plane, it shows that this vertex extends uh, to the downstream of the pier along both sides of the pier. Uh, along both sides of the pier and this vertex is called a horseshoe vertex and this is the main uh, feature responsible for the formation of uh, scour holes. So we uh, the LCS obtained from this velocity field that is uh, shown in figure 2, a and B on uh, symmetry plane and, uh, on 90 degree angle. In, in figure 2A, we can see uh, the red line, the no, uh, LCS. That, that LCS is uh, clear, is uh, clear, is able to demarcate uh, the boundary of the vertex from the remaining flow. Uh, from the symmetry plane, that is in figure 2A, Mm, the same is there on 90 degree angle plane that is on both sides of the pier in figure B. There also we can observe uh, the uh, separation of what like uh, extraction of vertex bo vertex boundary from the remaining flow. Uh, other than that, uh, we can even uh, uh, observe the LCS on both sides of the pier. Uh, it means that it, it is able to uh, separate the uh, the regions with high flow velocity because uh, the flow velocity is higher on both sides because uh, whenever there is um, because uh, the pier creates an obstruction and it leads to a uh, increase in the velocity on both sides and the LCS is able to extract that as well. So coming to uh, the uh, in figure C, uh, the LCS on different x y planes x y planes at different depths are shown in figure a figure 3 a b c and a is near to the free surface and b is on the near to uh, middle depth and c is inside the scour hole so if you see at all the levels the lcs is able to extract uh, the vertex shedding in the downstream of the pier so whenever we plot the velocity across the width we can observe uh, the sudden change in the velocity whenever there is a rise in the velocity field so coming to the conclusions, uh, Lagrangian coherence structures uh, are able to extract the uh, velocity field in the scour hole and at the upstream pier of the uh, pier as well. And they also identify the changes in the velocity magnitude on both sides of the pier, which was not which was not able to do, which was uh, cannot be done with the 
traditional techniques like uh, q criteria and vorticity and all uh, and and the thing is they also able to extract uh, the uh, vertex shading and downstream of the pier so this L these lcs act as a um, uh, what do you call this high shear uh, surfaces they uh, cannot uh, allow the sediment particles to cross with each other so they may play a significant role uh, in the transport of sediment in the downstream uh, in the downstream of the pier thank you Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And the first presenter asked to uh, present his work at the end of the session, as we said before, because uh, he had some problem with uh, the audio. Uh, so uh, we can pass to the third presenter, the third work. Uh, the title is uh, Modeling Fluvial Flows at Confluence of Tubal River and the Itok Stream with Rapidly Bearing Hydraulic Geometry uh, due to sand gravel mining. Uh, please go the word to the presenter. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitesh Kumar Yadav, and I am presenting my work titled as Fluvial Modeling Fluvial Flows at confluence of Thabal River into a river stream with uh, rapidly varying hydraulic geometry due to sand gravel mining. So the unregulated sand and gravel mining impacts the river systems adversely. So it is necessary to estimate the total, precisely estimate the total load of the rivers to assess the magnitude of the impact caused by mining. So in this study, we aim to determine the accurate sediment load transport method using the ACRAS platform. So in order to develop, uh, in this study, a numerical hydraulic model was developed to estimate the sediment load. So in order to develop the numerical model, we required two types of data, that is uh, spatial data and hydraulic data of the river. So uh, to develop from geospatial data, we extracted the river geometry and using this uh, hydraulic data, the rating curves were prepared uh, for input to the HECRAS model. Then the uh, other hydraulic parameters and factors were entered into the model. After the entering, after entering the hydraulic parameters and factors, we uh, and the uh, hydraulic parameters, then boundary conditions selected was the state discharge and the sediment rating curve. After input all the hydraulic parameters, uh, we selected different transport functions available in HECRAS platform to run the model and the results obtained from run, uh, using the uh, 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 simulated uh, results obtained from the model we plotted a graph between discharge and sediment discharge then to test the accuracy of the <coughs> model with uh, which compare with the observed value so from figure where two we can see that england hansen and Eckert's White and Toplati method underpredicted the sediment load, while Yang and Lawson method overpredicted the sediment load with, uh, with similar trends. And from table one, we can see the performance of transport equations based on the discrepancy ratio. Discrepancy ratio is the ratio between uh, ratio of the uh, calibrated load to the uh, observed load. So based on the table uh, from table one, we can see that the percentage of data coverage uh, from Young's method was 37.5 and Eckert's white 25. So this uh, Young's method can be considered as a method for estimating the load of the river. And the table two uh, from computed sediment discharge uh, load, we can see that uh, at the station Lerenthal, uh, the sediment dis flow discharge is, is non equilibrium sediment transport and disturb rate of the river flow, where riverbed aggregation is observed. The computed discharge of Kaval River at Mumbai PP has uh, increased considerably due to the 
where the river bed degradation is observed, which indicated the heavy replacement rate of the river due to amplified sand gravel mining. Uh, further, the summary results says that uh, in, from table two, the Young's method gave results closer to observed load and compared to England Henson and Eckers White method. The higher value of load computed using Young's may be due to the fact that it is an implicit function of stream power, which at equilibrium that of uh, which at equilibrium uh, when a dynamic fluvial system reaches at equilibrium, the rate of energy displacement is minimum. So, for conclusion, based on the accuracy of sediment transport methods used in this uh, model, uh, we can say that Yang's method gave the closest uh, estimation of the uh, sediment discharge. And further, from the model results, we can say that uh, this uh, tributary has some controls on the hydraulic geometry parameters of the mainstream of the river. Thank you. Thank you. So the next uh, work that will be presented is uh, estimation of a local scour around submerged uh, angles per dikes under ice cover. Uh, the presenter will be Goen Lee. Okay, please start. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, hello there. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining. So my name is Guo Wei, and I'm, today I'm presenting uh, our topic called Estimation of Local Scour Around Submerged Angles Spur Dikes Under S Cover. So <clears throat> a spur dike is basically a construction extending outward from the bank to deflect water away and protect the bank from erosion. And spur dikes will also trigger local scour, leading to uh, the lowering of the channel bed due to the imbalance of sediment transport. So the local scour around the spur dikes will resemble the scour process around the bridge abutments. And local scour will cause structure damages. But due to the complexity, um, most of, so we conduct experimental studies uh, and flume tests to understand the characteristics of local scour. And as for the empirical equations, uh, research on the a scour near a spur dike has been undertaken to forecast the maximum scour depths. And many of those equations were also developed using laboratory experiments and field data. Uh, however, their applications to the submerged spur dikes under ice cover were inefficient. So uh, we conducted some uh, flume experiments to uh, come up with a new equation. So the ice covers will typically observed in regions where the temperature fall below freezing points, such as where I'm located in Canada. And it will also uh, result in dramatic changes in flow velocity, sediment transport, and also the scour patterns. So in the present experimental study, we investigated the impacts of ice cover on the local scour depths around submerged spur dikes and checked the predominant empirical equations performances in estimating the local scour depths. So uh, our experiments incorporated combinations of spur dike alignment angles, overtopping ratios, that is the ratio of the deck height to the water depths, ice cover roughness and median green sizes of the bed materials. So the submerged spur dikes were oriented to the flume wall at three different angles of 90 degrees, 120 degrees, and 135 degrees, as has been suggested for submerged spur dikes. The overtopping ratio uh, ranges from 1 to 1.33, and two non-uniform sediments were used as riverbed material with median green parameters of 0.9 millimeter and 0.57 millimeter. Each setup ran under three different surface conditions, that is open channel, smooth ice covered, and rough ice covered flow conditions. And each experiment run lasted for 24 hours to ensure that the equilibrium uh, depth is reached. We have gathered a total of 72 sets of data due to uh, logistic reasons. And we aim to propose a more comprehensive scour depth estimation equation that incorporates the factors of submergence level and ice cover roughness. So the field data were then compared to equations developed in previous research, including equations derived by uh, Nagy for a non-submerged vertical wall spur dike using a semi-empirical analysis, and Hussan at all incorporating the dimension of abutment as well as uh, encroachment width to depth ratio and Froelich 
using dimensional and regression analysis of 164 publicly available laboratory experiment data. So the agreement between the observed and calculated data is shown in figure one. For <clears throat> Nagy, uh, the data sets fell under, the, like few data sets fell under the 30% error line and potentially due to the ignorance of the orientation angles impact that changes the shape factor. And the equation to uh, Froelich provides underestimated values for, the, for most of the trials. Very few, that is around 50% of the data points were located within the 30% error line. And the equation proposed by Hussein et al had a higher agreement <clears throat> with observed submerged spherodic results under ice cover. So we have observed that 80% of the points fall within the 30% error line. And the estimation that derived from our current study predicts the equilibrium scour depths uh, we much better. So we have observed that 95% of the points fall within the 30% error line. And in conclusion, <clears throat> The local scour equation proposed in previous literature is relatively simplified for generic hydraulic structures, which is convenient for engineering designs, yet fail to consider the influence of variables such as alignment angles, submergence levels, and ice cover conditions. To reduce the set wall effect in flume studies, uh, we also changed the, the uh, approach flow depths into the hydraulic radius. And the modified equation also considers the channel cover conditions, alignment angles, and also submergence levels of our spur dikes. And it provides a relatively accurate estimation of the equilibrium scour depths. Thank you. Thank you for your um, presentation. Uh, so we pass to the, the other one, uh, which should be the title, Determination and Prediction of Critical Suction Velocity for Efficient Sedimental Removal Throughout Hydro Suction, uh, who is the presenter? Yes, uh, hello, it was tip one and all. Akash. I'm Akash. Okay. Yes. Shall I start? Please go. Okay. Hello and namaste to one and all. I'm Akash Jaswal, a digital scholar at IIT Ruliki. I am here to present a part of my PhD work under this title. As we all know that reservoir sedimentation is detrimental and it reduces the storage capacity of reservoir, leading to a decreased water availability. So out of many methods that are used to uh, check the, remove the sedimentation from reservoir, hydrosuction is a, a sediment removal method that employs a vertical suction pipe positions that is positioned either below, on, or above the surface of sediment bed. This process utilizes the hydrodynamic forces to lift the particle from the surface of sediment bed. For the efficient sediment removal, critical aspects of uh, efficient sediment removal is a critical except aspect for any sediment removal technique. Critical suction velocity is one of the aspects out of many that is uh, affecting the efficient sediment removal during hydrosuction. Uh, this critical suction velocity represents the minimum suction velocity that is required to lift a particle uh, from its surface beneath the suction pipe. This study dwells into the dynamics of the sediment removal through the experimental in investigation, focusing on determination and prediction of the critical suction velocity. So to achieve this aim, a series of experiments were conducted in a strategically uh, designed tank that is shown in figure number one here. It was made in hydraulics laboratory of IIT Rurki. We have used uh, several input factors such as uh, diameter of the suction pipe and uh, sediment median size, suction inlet height of the pipe, that is the distance between the mouth of the pipe and the sediment bed. We have collected over 380 data. So for this collection, the suction velocity was gradually increased from the minimum value for a selected suction pipe and the suction inlet height for the each run. The suction velocity corresponding to the movement of uh, movement at which the particle start lifting off the surface was noted. Uh, so based on this data, we have uh, provided an empirical equation by dividing this data into 70-30 ratio for training and testing. So this uh, equation that we have presented here 
is uh, based on the least square method and it, uh, the R square value for this is uh, equation is 0.94 for training and testing data set. And this uh, equation was validated by comparing the experimentally observed and the computed uh, critical suction velocity value as shown in figure number two, demonstrate the close alignment between the uh, having the minimum error of 10%. So in conclusion, it's like, if we know, if we uh, like critical suction velocity is a key factor during the hydrosuction because it represents the uh, minimum velocity that is required to lift up the sediment from the bed. So if we know, what is it uh, for a uh, diame fixed diameter of the suction pipe and the critical uh, suction inlet depth? If we uh, know the critical suction velocity, then we can design our hydro suction in a better way. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So the next speaker is uh, Francisco Nicolas Cantaro Cincidia. Hello. Good afternoon. With... Hi, Francisco. With um, a presentation on uh, non-hydrostatic turbulent modeling of hydraulic jumps using a variational approach. Please, Francisco. Go. Yes, that's it. So thank you, everyone. Um, and good afternoon. So first of all, let me introduce you the topic. Um, accurate flow control in open channels is very important for environmental protection. And that involves an accurate uh, estimation of uh, hydrodynamic uh, processes of many types. Uh, one of the most challenging processes to simulate uh, using um, open channel models are the hydraulic jumps because uh, they integrate high turbulence as well as no hydrostaticity of flow and no uniformity of velocity distribution in depth. So the, um, uh, the hydraulic jumps can be sorted into undular, uh, whether the flow number is below 1.7 or broken if the uh, flow number is above two. So the prediction of this kind of uh, uh, hydrodynamic processes uh, using vertically averaged model is not simple. Actually, using the classical uh, shallow water equation is not enough uh, to simulate uh, jumps because they assume the uh, hydrostatic fluid pressure. Contrary, the using the type models can account for the no hydrostaticity of, uh, of flow. However, the depth variation of fluid velocity is normally neglected. So the, uh, they cannot uh, resolve turbulent features of hydraulic jumps. So when we um, uh, uh, talk about open channel models, um, we know now that we need to go uh, for consideration or generalized formulation for the flow variables, such as the two components of velocity. If we are talking about 1D simulations, uh, that is horizontal and, and vertical, as well as turbulent normal and tangential stresses. And this task is not simple when using vertically average non hydrostatic models. Um, the VAN models offer a suitable mathematical framework for this purpose. This type of models, um, uh, um, they use the method of weighted residuals to produce a mathematical crusher for the, uh, for the equation of the, of the system of equation generated. Um, and that is because uh, they imply uh, an expansion of the field variables using uh, many methods. Here we use the kantarovich krilov expansions for the field variable that introduce three parameters to model this variation in depth of the flow variables. Um, and then we produce the so-called variational runs model. This approach has uh, many potential in, in, in open channel flow, uh, but however, it has not been explored um, to the study of turbulent and hydraulic jumps, which is the objective of, of this study. So the philosophy be, be, behind this model is that we take the RANS model, uh, model equations, three dimensionals, and then we produce the, the depth averaging in depth of the, of the equations uh, using and considering uh, kantarovich krilov expansions for the flow variables. In this case, we used first order for the uh, horizontal velocity, second order for the vertical velocity, as well as the pressure velocity, uh, 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 flow uh, variable, and zero order for the energy production and energy dissipation variables. 
So once we have the uh, the, the system of equations uh, uh, using the weighted residual method to produce the mathematical closure of, for the free parameters, we select a suitable numerical scheme. In this case, uh, we are using a finite volumes, finite difference uh, scheme uh, with a strong stability preserving third order uh, for the time stepping. So the application of this model uh, for um, uh, modeling simulation of hydraulic jumps can be seen in the, in the figure of the poster, which is a, a transcritical flow over uh, a Gaussian wire uh, producing an hydraulic jump, so-called um, uh, undular. Um, uh, and, and we see that the model is able to accurately reproduce uh, both the free surface as well as the uh, bottom pressure. But however, um, it is very valuable that uh, the model can offer us um, information about the variables of flow, such as the velocity at the surface, at the bottom, and the behavior of the free parameters for any other variables, such as the, the, the pressure distribution, as we see in green. So um, jumping into the conclusions, uh, we can see that the, um, uh, we can say that the use of the weighted residual method, along with the Kantarovich grill of flow variable expansions, permits to develop any variational runs model that we want. And that the, but using the variational runs model, we are able to accurately reproduce uh, uh, challenging hydrodynamic processes such as broken and undular jumps. And thus, it allow us to, uh, um, uh, to recommend the vari variational runs model as a suitable alternative to using a type models in the field. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. So the next one is uh, the title. And we pass to the next one. Okay. The title should be not this one, but should be the other one. Numerical study. Give me a Numer second. Yeah. <laughs> Can you give me just a number? Uh, should be the seven. Seven. Then I have this one as seven. Um, but no, I will. I switch them. Thank you. So. Damn it. The presenter should be Om Prakash Maurya. Is here. Okay, so, give me a second. I need to check it in the folder because I don't find it. Yes. In the meantime, we can... Can we go to the following? Look for... Oh, we can go to the following. Yes. yes. Okay. That would be nice. So, the following is... Uh, the title is uh, Screw Around, Brip Wrap, okay. Protected Peers, A Numerical Assessment of the Effect of the Better Roughness. Okay. This is okay. Presenter should be Antonia Arasti, probably. She is here, okay. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Antonia Harasti. I am PhD student at the University of Zagreb in Croatia. Uh, today I'm going to show you a little part of my dissertation, which topic is based on a scour around bridge piers protected with rip wrap. In the middle of the screen, you can see figure that shows rip wrap protection that is mostly used in Croatia. 
It is consciously shaped riprap placed around the pier so that it exceeds above the riverbed up to the mean flow level. Such riprap sloping structure will cause scar hole downstream of the pier. Uh, to investigate this phenomenon, numerical model is established using Flow3D software. The model has been calibrated based on experiments in physical model, and there are a lot of different parameters in a numerical sediment transport model, which means a lot of different parameters that can be changed for calibration. But one of the most sensitive parameter is roughness height multiplier. Physically, uh, this parameter is used for calculating surface roughness of channel bed that is part of low of the wall function. Surface roughness uh, in low of the wall function uh, is product of the mean sediment grain size and roughness height multiplier. But what is actually this parameter roughness height multiplier in Flow3D? Uh, it is user-defined parameter that can be manually changed to artificially modify additional turbulence near the bed channel. So the aim of this study was to perform sensitivity analysis of roughness height multiplier. So four simulations were performed on the same model configuration by changing only roughness height multiplier. And it has been increased from initial value of 1 up to 7.5. Uh, on the top right of this screen, you can see the table with uh, results. As expected, increasing roughness height causes uh, increase in scar magnitudes. Uh, the position rate was also observed. Uh, the results demonstrate that the largest value of roughness height uh, of 7.5 increased initial scar depth by 42%. So from 0 0.7 centimeters to uh, 1.2 centimeters and the deposition for 75%. As we can see, this parameter is quite sensitive. Uh, based on this sensitivity analysis, we can conclude that roughness height multiplier is one of the most influential parameters in modeling sediment transport in Flow3D, and it needs to be included in calibration process to retain reliability of results. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Antonia. So, Arianna, we can go on with the other presentation. Okay, that's fine. Um, the next presentation is uh, uh, experiments on the formation of uh, 3D dunes. Is there the presenter of this work? Yeah, I am the presenter of the work. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, today, I want to introduce about the work. Uh, about the formation of the 3D dunes in laboratory scales. So the need of this work is uh, most of the literature in the about the dunes is carried out in the uh, carried out in the 2D dunes. So, but uh, the real field studies observed in the Missouri and other rivers shown that dunes are really have a complex shape than simplified 2D dunes. Most of the analytical models which use it for uh, uh, analytical uh, most of the experimental works which which done in the previous uh, literature has prepared some phase diagrams to show that how the dunes are how the dunes can form. With some uh, at one particular uh, velocity and with particular uh, sand size, so the classic concept of this formation is with at a one particular uh, sand size, if we keep on increasing the velocity, so bed will change from the different forms and ripples to dunes and then anti dunes. So the the actual, the, the uh, hypothesis of this work is to see what is the influence of sediment transport uh, uh, in in the in the experiments. So the main uh, question from the uh, question which raises it to this work is. Will to form the dunes without any uh, help of uh, without any sediment recirculation or without any help from the sediment transport. So the experiments are conducted in a hydraulic hydraulic lab in IIT Madras, uh, in a, with a 0.34 mm sand, and uh, and uh, with a flow number of 0. 0.4. And uh, as you see, that experiment is uh, carried on for uh, more than six hours, and uh, until the bed bed becomes 
uh, the water is the become constant, so it becomes like equilibrium condition. And the bed morphology is uh, measured with a laser, laser distal laser uh, gauge with a uh, every two centimeter resolution. So uh, at the end, at the and the dam is as shown uh, in the figure one. At the time of the six hours, you can see that the dam is four hours. You can see that the uh, uh, experimental bed is formed in the figure one as shown in the figure one. And uh, for the further analysis, these are the methods followed. Uh, so to analyze uh, that to uh, mathematically uh, show the uh, 3D parameter of the bed, we use the Pearson Pearson correlation coefficient. So the Pearson co correlation coefficient takes that uh, shows the correlation between the longitudinal and transverse profiles. So when the uh, June is uh, when the bed is actually at 2D, the correlation becomes high, and then uh, the value of that uh, 3D parameter becomes less. So when the when the June is as, as shown the the figure the bed is highly 3D. So uh, this one minus R square value becomes 0.98, which shows that. It is so in the, in the figure two we can see that in the phase diagrams it is indicated that both ripples and June's uh, compound bed form is formed, which is not expected as when the physical phase diagrams we expect that only June's will be uh, ripples will be ripples will form at this velocity. So uh, so this can it can be seen as the typical uh, phase diagrams did not give exact information about uh, phase of the uh, phase which can form. As which this uh, this conclusion also can be provided as in the Vendetti in his experiments, which is cited in the references. So uh, when when we uh, from the dem of the uh, from the dem file we, we measured it from the experimental bed, the following uh, that uh, bed is the ripples are uh, de are delineated and uh, and the geometrical parameters of ripples such as uh, their uh, height, wavelength, in wavelength in the width direction and the star height, star angles are measured using MATLAB. So on the statistics of of this uh, they are plotted uh, to see which which distribution they are following so for that uh, AC. For their uh, to one, so you can, as we can see in the figure three, so most of the uh, parameters are shown are uh, uh, different different distributions they are following, and most of them show unimodal uh, uh, variation. But uh, least side the distance and the wavelength jet has two modes, which is shown that where uh, June's wet uh, uh, forms which are formed as uh, is a nonlinear types, and. Uh, to, so to understand that, uh, to classify the bed phase from, uh, we use another approach, which is from uh, spectrums uh, to classify it. So the wave number spectrum is uh, shown as in the figure four. Uh, the, so the spectra of wave, the, the space series data is taken and it is transfer, uh, Fourier transform is used uh, to, uh, to send the frequency space. As we can see, there are dominant, more number of fre uh, frequencies, dominant frequencies are there. But as the uh, frequencies keep on, wave numbers keep on increasing, that uh, the spectral density is reducing, showing that uh, and the fit of that uh, curve is uh, shown that minus two slope, which is a uh, which is a for the ripple ripple slope uh, ripple field. So these are this is a uh, uh, these are the conclusions of the work. So wave number uh, weight minus two power law, which indicates as a ripple field, but uh, phase phase diagram shows uh, it is a uh, what com as the compound wave forms. So and uh, wavelength uh, directions from the bimodal parameters than other other uh, parameters. So when this results, we can conclude that most of the experiments in the uh, conclude in the full are very limited experiments are present. So we have to understand the role of the sediment size and cloud number to uh, understand how the dunes are formed and to, uh, to express this uh, dead domain. So these are these are, from the here I'll stop. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so. Uh, I think that the last presenter is not here, right? Uh, so we can move to the first one. Uh, so the title is uh, Entropy-Based Two-Dimensional Velocity Distribution for Open Channel Flows. Presenter should be Gurpinder Singh. I'm promoting him as panelist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I start? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present my topic that entropy based uh, 2D velocity distributions for open channel flow. And for this research, we have employed yeah, uh, we have employed the Kapoor entropy based you know, technique for driving the velocity distribution model. Uh, and the uh, principle of maximum entropy based uh, technique was also employed for the entropy maximizations. Uh, 
Uh, I don't understand if uh, we have some problems or Gurpinder. Yeah, now audible? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, the drive to Kapoor and trough based uh, uh, velocity distribution was used to quantify the velocity distributions in open channel flows and the uh, the derived model was only depending on the entropy uh, parameter that is defined as B and an entropy index alpha, whose value was uh, statistically fixed using the uh, field and experimental data. And for further the validation and calibration of the model, experimental uh, and field data was uh, used. Uh, the field data was taken from the already published uh, research papers and the experiments were conducted on the laboratory room for the uh, laboratory uh, experimental data. And the results can be uh, seen in the figure one and figure two. Uh, figure one shows the field data where the three uh, verticals uh, in a, uh, for a river section were taken and the uh, proposed model was well calibrating the field data. Similarly, second figure was for the clear water flow in which uh, it was compared with the four different uh, entropy-based models such as Shannon entropy-based, uh, Sally's entropy-based, Rennie entropy, and fractional entropy-based models. And the proposed model was, uh, was behaving at par with the earlier uh, models. Uh, now for uh, conclusions, the, uh, the alpha value that is the entropic parameter only uh, proposed model was on which it was depending. Its value was fixed as uh, 10 with the statistical uh, techniques using the earlier uh, data. And a new entropy parameter was also defined for simplifying and eliminating the nonlinear relations uh, using uh, based on the Lagrangian multipliers. Also, the uh, ratio of maximum and mean velocity was calibrated to the and connected to the entropy parameter B, and which was surmised as constant for a particular velocity uh, sections. Later, a comparative study was done for the earlier four considered entropy-based models and the proposed model, and uh, in which it was observed that the proposed model was uh, obtaining good results as compared to the earlier versions, uh, having a low mean and standard deviation values. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Probably uh, we have the the seven one. I don't know if uh, we have the presenter of, uh, or we can consider that uh, we. No, I don't know that it was uh, uh, cancelled because. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we have finished the session, the presentation section, uh, and we start uh, with the discussion. We have. Uh, around 30 minutes more, more than. Uh, so please, if you have uh, any question for all the presentations. I think we could start from the Q&A because I see a question there. And then maybe yes. we can go on okay. to the others. Okay, so we can start with the uh, the question in the chat, I'll read it, uh, is from uh, Matteo Savino. Uh, he uh, writes, hi, I have a question to, to, for Francisco Nicolas Cantero Schincilla regarding his presentation. I wanted to ask him if he did some convergence analysis refining the mesh in order to understand if his numerical model is stable. Thank you. Yes, yes, we did a um, uh, convergence uh, grist, uh, grid test using, uh, as I remember, five centimeter, three centimeter, two centimeter, and finally one centimeter grid uh, step in the mesh. The convergence uh, was very good. However, the current um, Frederick Levy number has to be decreased. Okay. Um, 
So um, it is okay for Matteo? Is okay as answer? Okay. Uh, I also have to know um, uh, your numerical model is a commercial one or is uh, unmade? Not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay. We are so testing so this approach. This approach is is quite novel. It's, it's actually it's not novel because um, it's um, an approach uh, that uh, comes from the work of Cheng um, Steffler, Steffler and Jing from mm -hmm. uh, 1992. Um, the approach is, is quite simple. It's just uh, using the depth averaging of the Rans equation, but uh, instead of using um, constant velocity in depth, then we are using three, three free parameters integrated into the vertical velocity distribution. And then we need uh, three more equations to close mathematically the, the system. Okay. So, so the concept is, is is very easy to understand, but the, the models are very complicated to solve. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. I okay. have uh, another question for Francisco. Yes, so, Nadia. What is the next steps of uh, your research? Uh, if you plan to apply this approach to other cases, if uh, yeah. we are we are still studying different orders of magnitude for the expansion of the variables. That is, we study first order and it's quite good, but we want to study what happens if we go through uh, two or uh, second order, third order and fourth order for velocity. We uh, expect better results, not only for the free surface uh, simulation, but also for the simulation of the, uh, of the variation of the variables in depth itself. After that, we need to go and pursue um, a suitable, robust, and fast numerical scheme. <laughs> that, that will imply several years. And after that, we need to expand this into the uh, two-dimensional uh, in, in the plane. That will imply more years. Yeah, I know, I know. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Uh, are some other questions? Uh, I have a question for the um, third that, that at the end it was uh, the second one and <laughs> the second one uh, presenter uh, regarding is should be Kumar uh, regarding modeling uh, uh, at the uh, confluence uh, of Tubal River. Um, so um, because uh, uh, confluence is a very uh, interesting um, uh, place in uh, river and uh, secondary flow and the turbulence is very high. Um, I'd like to understand uh, uh, because uh, if I understood well, uh, you use the ECRAS 2D uh, as a numerical code and um, to compare different formula to estimate uh, sediment transport to total sediment transport. So I'd like to know uh, if you used to define the uh, sensitivity analysis uh, uh, by using, by comparing uh, measured data, uh, how uh, did you measure that, uh, both for sediment transport and uh, flow discharge? Uh, actually, the river is uh, an edge river, so we are recording this uh, flow and discharge data at daily 10 day interval. So, and due to this uh, limitation of data, we are not able to calibrate this model. And as you are asking whether uh, we have tried this 2D flow, so right now we haven't tried this 2D flow. Uh, actually, uh, right now we are only considering uh, focusing on the 1D model of the river. So, after determining the accurate uh, transport method, We'll like to uh, proceed to uh, towards the 2D uh, modeling of the river. So, uh, did you estimate the for each uh, uh, rich uh, 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 forming? Yes, we, we, uh, we, in this study, we have considered uh, three stations. Uh, that okay, mainly... three sections. Yes, because I, I I don't hear very well, so <laughs> there is oh, an echo. So... That's okay. Yeah. Uh, 
in this study we have considered only three station uh, as you okay. can see in table uh, my table the two uh, the upper stream is table uh, upper stream cross section named as uh, lyrang cell and uh, that that is on the main main river and the tributary which is joining the towel river uh, that is itok river after that uh, we have considered one cross section which is at the downstream point of the confluence point so we are uh, this in this day we have considered only three two at the each upper stream section and one at the downstream of the confluence mm, okay okay thank you thank you for your answer thank you i have another question for you yes so uh, how did you evaluate the accuracy of your results or did you perform uh, a statistical analysis on that uh, on uh, the on the obtained the results or not yes uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, we have accepted uh, this uh, discrepancy ratio of 0.5 to 2, uh, 2 uh, for evaluating the uh, results of uh, model tested in this uh, uh, study so yeah we have uh, taken a discrepancy ratio as the accuracy to predict the model Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Some other question to Kumar? No questions? Uh, uh, curiosity uh, I have uh, for uh, Gurpinder Singh uh, for the application of uh, an entropy-based model. Um, I'd like to, to understand well uh, um, which is the difference uh, with the, uh, the Shannon entropy model and, um, and so which is the ab advantage uh, to use uh, your uh, um, proposed model. And uh, if you um, define a comparison in the case in which uh, the maximum velocity does not occur at the free surface uh, when uh, DIP occurs at it, as an example. So if you can uh, explain a little bit uh, clearly uh, these two aspects, please. Gurpinder? Hello. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry, I have... <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Now we hear you. Yeah. Actually, ma'am, uh, for this, like I have considered four other models. Like uh, earlier I told you, uh, Shannon's uh, based uh, Sally's and Rennie and fractional entropy based models. And uh, the main difference was like in the uh, application and meanwhile in the formulations, like it was only depending on the one parameter that is uh, entropy based and the entropic index. That too was uh, st uh, established to be fixed using the uh, previous uh, study, uh, like historical data sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's, like the other models was uh, they were depending on uh, uh, more than one parameters so basically it made a difference here okay yeah uh, and secondly we also tried to uh, uh, enhance the uh, cdf functions uh, cumulative distribution functions also that uh, more or less uh, somewhat i have not shown here like it is a part of my phd work Okay. Yeah. Actually, you... due to audio, I I have uh, I was not able to listen your whole question. Sorry, pardon. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have one question for Cyprus at the Bodapati. Is he here? That's my man here. Okay. So. Uh, may you explain us the way in which you uh, measure the bed the morphology? And um, I have also a suggestion for you 
mm, because yeah, I'm interested in this uh, this uh, uh, field. So I, I I suggest you to uh, improve the statistic analysis going beyond the second order statistics because you can uh, obtain more uh, information uh, applying uh, an high order statistics to your data. Sure, ma'am. Uh, the how uh, I measured the bed morphology is we have a laser uh, uh, distance, uh, laser or this uh, distance meter. So after the end of the experiment, we uh, we slowly remove the water from the foam and we measured if uh, uh, every two centimeters. We 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 just uh, slowly move the laser and took the elevation readings. And uh, regarding this uh, statistical analysis, yeah, my, more uh, statistical methods are used. Uh, like I also used it, uh, wavelet analysis, uh, wavelet modes to uh, to find the threshold to uh, to classify the waveforms, the ripples and dunes. So most of the results are not shown here. Yeah, yes, I will consider taking second order statistics also. Too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Some other questions? Curiosity. I have another question for uh, um, Antonia Rasti. Me too. Ah, okay. <laughs> go, go on. <laughs> okay. So uh, I would like to know if uh, you have compared your numerical results with experimental ones or if you plan to do that in the, in the future. Hi. Um, yes, I uh, compare those results with laboratory results. Um, they are quite similar, but uh, in laboratory, uh, the duration of simulations lasts for 30 hours and duration of simulation in Flow 3D uh, was approximately uh, 600 seconds. So this um, tells us that this is not uh, maximum scar depth or uh, equilibrium uh, state. So uh, based on experimental results, um, I can say that after 600 seconds in Flow 3D, uh, scar depth reached approximately 50% of maximum scar depth. Have I answered your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. The question is, was related to the, the way in which you compared your results, uh, your numerical results, because you, you have shown us uh, your numerical uh, uh, results. So I, would, I, I uh, was interested in to uh, understand if you compared uh, those data with uh, experimental ones. So, okay, thank you. Actually, that is the purpose of a mm -hmm. study, to yeah. compare them and to calibrate a numerical model based on physical. Mm -hmm. But since this is not part of this uh, sensitivity analysis, um, I'm interested only in relative scar depths. It's not uh, the crucial thing to compare maximum equilibrium scar depth. Okay, okay. I, I have a question related to, to this one. Um, First, uh, how did you uh, estimate the uh, equilibrium condition? And, um, and now you are uh, explaining uh, about uh, experimental also data. So also for experimental one. And um, another um, uh, question regards uh, how uh, do you think that uh, the um, uh, maximum score depth uh, increases as uh, uh, the um, uh, you you show us uh, the increase of score depth uh, as uh, the roughness increases, right? Um, do you think that uh, uh, it should be determined by 
uh, the um, uh, development of uh, more uh, intensity of turbulence of uh, additional headies. Uh, if you, for example, uh, made some experimental, uh, uh, you have some experimental results of the flow velocity data. What do you think about this? Um, so uh, surface roughness uh, is calculated based on that parameter that I tested, roughness height multiplier. And as I mentioned, the purpose is to additionally uh, increase turbulence, which means that uh, since the initial state of uh, my model is flat bed, okay. um, you see, actually, I tried to uh, compare my uh, model with um, field data also and uh, laboratory data. But since the model uh, in uh, numerical simulations is flatbed, I tried to increase that turbulence additionally. Um, the second question was regarding to how it increases car depth or, sorry, I'm Just, not uh, Physically, uh, it could be attributed to um, an increase in turbulence intensity, as I suppose, uh, if you estimated this, uh, or if uh, you measured uh, throughout experimental experiments uh, or not, um, if you can comment about this. Uh, yes, so uh, in laboratory, we measure turbulence and velocity filled uh, with ADV profiler. Okay. And based on those results, I compared a cross-sectional flow field in a numerical model and compared it until I'm satisfied with results. Yes. Okay. And since this kind of turbulence is especially complicated because uh, peer is not single, it is protected with reprep. Uh, it induces a large number of small uh, eddies downstream. Exactly. So, yeah. Yes, this is my question. If you uh, observe this, yeah. Yeah. The okay. greatest problem in numerical model actually is to choose a right uh, turbulence model because in right. Flow 3D there is only several ones. Uh, in this uh, study, I used uh, RNG model, but afterwards, LES model showed to be more uh, suitable for this kind of turbulences that appears in uh, the laboratory. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And I imagine that uh, you had to calibrate before the numerical model by using uh, experimental data, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. And, and there choose, are to choose also the the turbulence model to use. Yes, definitely. There is uh, several more parameters that needs to be considered, so, uh, such as uh, critical shields number, yeah, and uh, angle of repose of uh, the channel bottom and uh this yeah. one I chose to show you because uh, roughness showed to be the most influential on scar depth because that looked quite interesting to me. Yeah, I yeah, understand. Yeah. It's tricky to additionally increase turbulence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another curiosity that I'm thinking now, uh, numerically, how did you simulate the... Um, increasing roughness only by increasing the parameter, right? So it's only a numerical roughness, right? Right. Um, yes, if we speak about uh, channel bed. Yes. So yes. channel bed is uh, increased only with this parameter. Yeah. I understand. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you can see that there are two questions for Murali. I can read it for you. So does Rand's models can explain LCS dynamics? 
And another, another question is, uh, if runs gave horseshoe vortex dimension, does complex methods like Lyapunov method are performing better than standard streamline methods? Since your reference paper, they and Riker uses uh, streamline method. So, Murali? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, for LCS calculation, we use the velocity data. We read velocity data. So we can obtain velocity data from like if the simulation or from an experimental measurement. So uh, the accuracy of LCS depends on the accuracy of LCS, uh, like velocity data. Mm, if we uh, use the L velocity from a uh, trans simulation, uh, we'll get the LCS gives the like uh, what are the features there in the uh, velocity field in the trans simulation, whereas it changes if we use the velocity data from the LCS simulation. So it depends on um the type of uh, like uh, the type of velocity data we used and coming to the other question like uh, mm, yeah lcs will give um uh, we use lcs will give better like uh, more features uh than that visible from the streamlines for example in my uh, presentation i have shown you that the lcs is able to uh, extract the um, the region with high velocities on both sides of the pier, which is not visible from the uh, streamlines. And as well as uh, it is like, uh, can give better results compared to the other uh, um, like uh, uh, techniques like Q-criterion and all, because they depend on a threshold value here. We don't have any threshold. Uh, even though if we change uh, the number of particles released in the LCS, um, the like uh, the boundary of the vertex will remain uh, will remain same, whereas in other methods it will change if you change the threshold. Thank you. So Sai Prasad, uh, is it okay for you? Okay. Okay, there is another question for Akash. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I can see this yeah. question. Of public <laughs> uh, in okay. the real day, the I read it for everyone. So, capability <laughs> in real dams having high sediment load is any reservoir is downscaled for using specific pump capacity. Yes, actually, uh, in India, uh, there is no case of use of hydrosuction for sediment removal. Uh, we are working on some project yet, though. At IIT Rurki. but uh, this method is already being applied to several uh, reservoir. Like uh, uh, in Alpine Reservoir in Italy, they have used in 1990, and the reservoir capacity was almost like uh, filled with 50 percent in last 20 years, and they have come. They have reduced this to 20 percent in uh, 10 a decade of this uh, using this hydrosuction, and also in Algeria, this DG. The Jua Reservoir in Algeria, they have also done the same in 1985. In France, in Ramon, Ramon John Dam, they have used it and they have uh, reduced the capacity by uh, 30, uh, increased the capacity of reservoir by like 35 percent. So uh, there is a chance uh, to use it in different reservoir. But uh, this second question is, um, does reservoir need to be downscale? I think it is a question about like... Uh, uh, reservoir is being uh, the capacity of reserving increased. If the question is that, so we can see the result from uh, past experience of different countries they have used in the reservoir. So yes, we can use it. There are different methods. If the reservoir is very uh, big, big reservoir in the sense of height, so we can use like long pipe and uh, connect it to to, uh, to the floating panels that is connected to the pump, and we can remove the sediment to the downstream and use it for different purposes. I hope this answers your question. Is it okay, Sai Prasad? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have a curiosity for um, Akash too. Yes. Um, 
I, I suppose that the critical assumption velocity uh, and um, performance of the system could be uh, could depend on the range of the sediment diameter, right? Yes, yes. Yes, so sure. We have, uh, we have done uh, this experiment within the fine and medium range of the sediment. Okay. Uh, in, uh, sorry, can you, uh, can you repeat which yes, sites? We have done this. Yes, fine to medium range segment. It was like 0.2 mm to 0.36 mm. We can go up to, we can uh, do this experiment for uh, different range of segment, then we can include. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is my question. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If we don't have any more question, I would ask everyone please to turn on their camera so that we can make a photos of this session. Speakers of fluvial hydraulics and hydraulics and eco hydraulics, we go together. It's the same system. So please smile, three, two, one, thank you, great. Thank, thank you, you. thank you, yes. So I know if we can finish the session, uh, yeah, we can conclude. Uh, so thank you very much. To everyone, to all presenter for the really interesting presentation and works. Uh, thank you, Nadia, uh, we share with me. And uh, thank you, Arianna, uh, for um, uh, this session. And so we can go on uh, with the other session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for staying yeah. online yeah. in this session. Thank I think. You all. Thank you. Yeah. We can now start adding presenters to the next yeah. one. I leave next the session, space yes. for Emanuele. Yes. Yeah. Go. We start in eight minutes. So I invite all the speakers to raise their hands so that uh, we can add them to the panel session. You are already panelists, you don't need to yeah. raise your hands. Yeah, people who are already panelists, yes, they are already okay. Hi, Emanuele. Hi, everybody. Hi, Michele. Nice to How meet you. How are you? I think we need some minutes more. Please, speakers, raise your hand so that we can promote you as panelists.
Hi, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Hello. Hello. I think we can ask presenters of the past session to leave the room, or I can just uh, add them to the audience if you prefer. Yes, okay. Thank you, Ariana. Hi, Andre. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hi. We are waiting for uh, yeah, the beginning of minutes. the session. Okay. Great. Then I leave the floor to you because you told us that you must leave, okay? Thanks very much. You're welcome. So please, speaker of this session, raise your hand because I cannot find any more. Okay, if you are already panelist, is already okay. But among the attendees, if there is another other speaker. Okay, Mr. Gautam, you're already panelist, so okay, you're fine. So among the attendees, if you if there are speakers, please raise your hand. So the last call for the last speakers, if there is some any, any speaker who is not still in the panel, please raise your hand. Okay, so we we can start. So very welcome for to this last session of today, but uh, I warmly encourage you to join also tomorrow. This session will be on hydraulics and equihydraulics and will be chaired by Professor Michele Mossa, Daniel Heiss, and Andres Antiller. Professor uh, Michele Mossa is Professor of Hydraulics at the Department of Civil Environmental Land Building Engineering and Chemistry at Polytechnic University of uh, Bari. His main research topics are related to maritime, river, and environmental hydraulics. Then Daniel Hayes is a river ecology and management researcher at the University of Natural Resources and Life Science in Vienna. He received his PhD from the University of Lisbon, Portugal, and the University of Natural Resources and Life Science. Andre Hiller is a professor at the National Institute for Scientific Research 
and uh, is a graduate school at the University of Quebec Network. He specializes in eco-hydrology and physical habitat modeling. So I will uh, give the floor now to the chair. I will just say a few words about the organization of this session. So to the panelists, uh, you have six minutes to present your poster. Please stay until the end because the question will be discussed at the end of the session. Uh, I will share your poster so you don't have to share anything unless there are some problems. And uh, if you have some questions, please write them in the question and answer um, system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emanuele. Can I start? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to be here to chair this uh, session together with Professor Daniel Ice. Uh, uh, before starting uh, uh, for the eco hydraulics in, on behalf of all the, the, tec the, the technical committee on eco hydraulics, uh, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Andres Saint Hilaire because there is uh, an incoming Congress uh, in Canada on eco hydraulics uh, and uh, it must leave us, and so uh, we must change the order. So please, Andre, if you want to share your screen. Uh, and give us some information about this Congress, this very interesting Congress on eco hydraulics. Thanks very much, Michele. Can you see my screen? And is are you seeing the presentation? Yes, thank you. So uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm here simply to forward a message from Canada. We are very happy to be hosting the International Symposium of Eco-Hydraulics and Fish Passage uh, this coming month of May in 2024. Uh, it's the uh, return of the Eco-Hydraulics Conference in North America. It has been here, the last time it was here was in 1996. And we are very happy to band together with another organization dealing with Fish Passage. And so the title of the conference is Eco-Hydraulics and Fish Passage connectivity and processes across the riverscape. Uh, we're going to hold a conference in Quebec City. So from the map, you can see the map of Canada, north of the United States. The little dot uh, shows you the location of the city of Quebec. It is a UNESCO heritage site. It is one of the oldest city, if not the oldest in North America founded by the French and then conquered by the English in the uh, 17th, 18th century, sorry. Uh, it is the only walled inner city uh, in North America, completely walled. Uh, we're going to hold the venue at the Hotel Concord, which you see on the uh, large picture. And uh, we're right by the St. Lawrence River. And as you can see on the right-hand side, it provides some impressive scenery with the Montmorency Falls, uh, just a few minutes outside of the downtown area. We have many sub teams. We're going to talk about different uh, spatial scales, looking at new tools for upscaling. We're going to talk about remote sensing, telemetry, big data. Um, we're going to talk, of course, about fish passage since our partners are focusing on this topic. Uh, we're going to talk about habitat con connectivity, uh, looking at thermal habitats across spatial scales, looking at the large river systems such as the St. Lawrence, but other as well and uh, hoping to get a few presentations on winter dynamics as well. Uh, we're also trying to include some presentations on traditional knowledge and how to include them in our analyses and model. Of course, dams and hydropower are gonna be central. We're gonna hold special sessions on environmental flows. Uh, we're gonna look at vegetation and eco-hydraulics. Of course, advances in numerical methods will be central. We're going to have sessions on stream restorations and ecosystems engineers. We're also going to hold workshops. The two ones that are planned so far is a workshop on the inclusion of fuzzy logic in fish habitat modeling. A second one will be how to construct low cost electronic data loggers and other devices. And we're hoping to add a few more workshops before the end of the year. So far, um, uh, you can certainly look up the information on our website. So it's called ISE-FP for International Symposium on Eco-Hydraulics and Fish Passage 2024.org. 
Uh, we have now, it says 168 submission, but as of this morning, we have 196 submission, and there's still 24 hours to go before uh, we reach the uh, deadline for abstract submission, so you have another day to do so. And uh, our costs are fairly low, um, so we're looking at a regular registration for 800 Canadian dollars, that's less than 600 American dollars, and for students, 300 Canadian dollars, so again, relatively cheap. So we hope uh, that will be uh, attractive. And with this, I'd like to thank you. And I guess, well, not sure that I can entertain questions, but if I can, I will. Thank you very much, Andre. So I uh, warmly recommend to submit uh, uh, your abstracts and also uh, to attend this uh, Congress. Uh, I don't know if there are questions on this point, because as I told you previously, Andre is uh, going and so uh, is not able then uh, to uh, answer our questions later. Are there questions? Of course, then you can visit the website that uh, was reported in the presentation uh, in order to have further information. Uh, Andre, I think there aren't the questions. So thank you very much for uh, uh, this information. Keep in touch because, as you know, uh, as a technical committee, we are working also for the questions that we discussed during uh, our meeting uh, some uh, days ago. Thank you again. Great. Well, thanks very much. Hope to see you all in Quebec City. Bye. Sure. <laughs> thank you. So uh, I think. Uh, that we can start the session with the presenters uh, and uh, in my list the first one uh, the first presentation uh, is entitled the continuous measurements of uh, river action using a new generation of underwater acoustic tomography system so please the presenter uh, okay thank you very much to share the screen you can start your presentation thank you Oh, thank you very much. So it's around. Can you first? Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Ah, thank yes, you it's very okay. Much. It's okay. Fine. Sorry. So it's around one thirty after midnight in Hokkaido, Japan. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Basil Al Sawaf. I will. Uh, so let me start with my title. So the title is Continuous Measurement of River Flow and Flow Direction Using a New Generation of Underwater Acoustic Tomography System. So as a brief start, so as many of you know that uh, river accurate and continuous measurement of river flow is very important because uh, the data is very important in uh, uh, water-related application design and also to understand the river system during flood uh, periods, etc. So one of the research applications that we are doing in our laboratory is to continuously and accurately measure the river flow using a new generation of underwater acoustic system. And this system called the Fluval Acoustic Tomography System or the FAT system, which is the which had been developed by Hiroshima University. And uh, this system actually is to some extent uh, similar to the acoustic velocity meters. So uh, the backbone of measurement by means of the FAT system is uh, the time of travel, uh, time of travel. So that is to say, so in order to make measurement of river flow or discharge, what you have to do is to place at least two stations, acoustic stations, one of uh, in the upstream and the other one uh, located near to the downstream, like in P1 and P2. And then for each time step or time interval you have to you have two information the first one is the cross sectional average velocity and the other one is the cross sectional area and the mul multiplication of these two terms gives you the discharge however in order to estimate the discharge directly here you have also to add or to include the uh, flow direction so that is to say the flow Streamwise flow is not necessarily to be straight line, so it could be diverted either to right bank or slightly to the left bank. Uh, yes, so for that reason, so in order to estimate the flow direction exactly and continuously, so what I did here in this study is I placed uh, three systems, as you can see here, P1 and P2, and also from P1 to P3. 
uh, like in triangle uh, distribution. And then I estimated the uh, and then I simulated the discharge along those two streamlines. So by solving the continuity equation, so because we, we assume that the, the uh, discharge along P1, P2, and also along P1, P3 should be the same. And also here, the stream should be stressed that this is a unidirectional stream. So in other words, the flow should be from upstream to downstream. So by doing this so we can determine which case uh, by considering the value of uh, cross section average velocity along the two uh, cross sections p1 p2 and p1 p3 and also the uh, cross sectional area a1 and a2 we can determine which case is valid so once we can determine the case we can calculate the stream flow uh, direction and also the uh, value of discharge itself so here, as you can see on the right-hand uh, panel, we determined first the uh, cross-sectional average velocity along the two streamlines, P1, P2, and also P1, P3. And here, you can see in the figure 2P, the variation uh, or the temporal variation in the uh, flow direction along P1, P2. Uh, and finally, then we were able to calculate the discharge by means of the path or tomography, as you can see in the uh, figure number 2C, the black line. And then we compared by another independent record, which is the rating curve, denoted by the red line. And the error percentage seems to be uh, that the measurement was uh, in very good agreement with the rating curve, unless during a little bit uh, the falling limp, there was slightly a difference, maybe because the measurement were uh, performed somewhere near to, to a mender. So maybe, or the equation itself should be improved a little bit. So to conclude in this study, we demonstrated that the minimum number of acoustic stations to estimate the river flow direction is uh, can be reduced to three, which is very practical and uh, easier. And also uh, in this study, we determined the new guidelines to continuously estimate the river flow direction using a triangular configuration of three tomographic system. So for as for future step, we need to also consider different kind of distributions. For example, the now currently we are considering like the zigzag uh, distribution. So this is could be also vital for streams that uh, have stringent places. Yeah, and that's all for today. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Daniel, it's your turn, please. Thank you very much for this presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? If not, I'll, I'll start. So basically, so, so how would you continue to go on in the future? How are you applying this technology in future studies? In a sense, how are you using potential advantages that you showed or disadvantages in the next steps? Yes, well, this uh, experiment had been done in Hiroshima. So now I'm doing uh, currently another experiment in or monitoring in Hokkaido. So the streams in Hokkaido are a little bit different from the mainland of Japan uh, because here it's called the region. So also the streams itself uh, are smaller and, and narrower. So here we are considering a different type of first of frequency. So we need here to consider high frequency because the stream is very shallow and narrow. And also we need to consider zigzag pattern because, uh, yeah, because the presence of a lot of, uh, let me see, trees or wood, because Hokkaido maybe, as you know, that is recently governed by Japan, so 150 years ago. So still the streams itself is not as developed as uh, in the case of uh, mainland of Japan. So yeah, one of the, this is one of the advantages and disadvantages, for example, that uh, still I face some problems related to velocity. So using zigzag, for example, in some places I have secondary flow. So I have a kind of uh, negative uh, velocity. So, and this is seems not logic because yeah, the effect of uh, secondary, or circulations, this make the results to be considered or improved. 
Uh, Daniel, okay. uh, if you agree, okay. we can have yes. all the presenters or the presentations, ah, okay. and then we can have the discussion during the coffee break and the discussion with the mentors, if you agree. Ah, okay, perfect. Then I'll pass it on. No, so... I, it's okay. <laughs> we can change. It's not uh, an obligation, yeah. of course. So okay. if you want, you can introduce the second introduce speaker. The, the next speaker is on the study on aeration efficiency of a gabion ware by K.M. Luxmi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So the floor is yours. Uh, it's KM Lakshmi, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hi, we hear you. All is well. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, of this presentation, my topic is uh, study on aeration efficiency of gabion gear. Uh, oxygen uh, essential for both human and aquatic life. So I am using here to increase the to uh, increase the oxy oxygen by the by using hydraulic structures. And hydraulic structures are employed to improve aeration efficiency and gabion wears for this purpose to increase the oxygen. Uh, the advantages, uh, advantages are uh, eco eco by the ecological and environmental advantages that enhance their utility in aeration. In this current study, a comparison was conducted between the flat gabion wear and stepped gabion wear. The results indicate that uh, the indicate that flat gabion wear outperforms the stepped gabion wear. I have done these experiments in the laboratory, which has channel dimensions 0.25 meter width, 0.3 meter depth, and 4 meter length, and a transparent water tank made of acrylic sheet having dimensions of 0.87 meter cube. In and model one that indicates a flat gabion wear. And model two indicates a step one step to gabion wear, and other model two is indicate indica, is indicating uh, two step to gabion wear. I have I have calculated dissolved oxygen levels by using the Winkler's method, uh, and these ex, uh, equations I have used E is equal to C D minus C U upon C S minus uh, C U, where C D indicates downstream concentration of the oxygen. And CU indicates upstream concentration of the oxygen. And CS is taking here saturation, saturation concentration of oxygen level. And the second equation, I'm using 1 minus E20 equal to 1 minus E to the power F, where F is indicating exponent used to consider the temperature of that water. And here we can see a graph which indicates the relationship, relationship between the discharge and the aeration efficiency at 20 degree centigrade temperature and it indicates it indicates that uh, flat gabion wear which is model 1 outperforms the uh, model 2 and model th 3 and here uh, i have i have many results uh, the, the results uh, say that the flat gabion wear exhibits superior aeration efficiency compared to one-stepped and two-stepped gabion wear models. This heightened efficiency is attributed to the increased uh, turbulence generated by the flat gabion wear, which results from its ability to produce a more robust nappe when compared to one-stepped and two-stepped gabion wears. And uh, here the conclusion. In this study, the discharge mean size, porosity, and drop height are taken as input parameters and output parameter is aeration efficiency. The efficiency of aeration rises with an increase in drop height. Additionally, the type of particles used to fill the gabion is a crucial factor for influencing water aeration because the water can pass through the weir and over the weir. Furthermore, aeration efficiency increases with a higher discharge rate, notably the flat gabion weir outperforms the stepped gabion weirs in terms of aeration efficiency. And these are the references which I have taken to study this uh, addition efficiency of given view. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, now it's the turn of the third 
um, presenters. Uh, the title of the poster is Effect of Hydro Generator Rotor Eccentricity on Unbalanced Magnetic Pool. Please consider that this session is also hydraulics and uh, uh, eco hydraulics. So, some of the presentation uh, uh, are very peculiar. So, if you can share the screen. It's okay, you can start. Sorry, I'm not able to hear from you. Can you check your microphone, please? Sorry, we can't hear. Emanuele, can you hear? Maybe we can go to the next presenter and then again call him at the, at the end. Absolutely, I agree with you. So we can go on with the other presenter. Uh, Daniel? Do you so want to me, present it? Yes, thank you. So You're I welcome. would like to, to introduce David Array, uh, who will present to us on the design and construction of a cross-flow turbine rotor fabricated with recycled polymers. So David, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, my name is David Array from uh, Central University of Venezuela, located in Caracas, Venezuela. And today, uh, I would like to talk to you about uh, our project, which is uh, the design and construction of a cross-flow cross -flow turbine uh, rotor fabricated with recycled polymers. So to give you a little introduction, um, the, one of the main goals uh, of this project was uh, to um, uh, uh, contribute with uh, electricity generation uh, by, uh, with the cross-flow turbine as a micro-generation. And also, um, but not only that, but also um, to contribute with the re with reducing the plastic waste in the environment. Okay, giving a new purpose to the the recycled plastics. Now, um, about the methods of this project. Well, um, we uh, for this project we considered numerous factors. Uh, the first one was uh, the time uh, limitations we had. We had a really tight schedule and we had a deadline for this project. Also, the, the economy, uh, we, we had a really tight budget. Uh, also, uh, we considered the um, the equipment availability and the, the material availability. So uh, we, we had access to a 3D printer and we also, uh, uh, in case of the material availability, we we um, we selected the PLA and PETG filaments, uh, recycled uh, PLA and recycled PT, PETG filaments, uh, which are uh, currently really uh, relatively easy and cheap to acquire. Okay, so uh, once we and uh, once once we carried out the design, the hydra hydraulic design of the of the rotor, the turbine, um, we we made the uh, CAD model of the, of the rotor and then imported it to the to the 3D printer in order to fabricate the rotor. So, uh, which is the one you can see in the poster and I have it right here. Um, uh, the rotor it's, uh, was printed in two parts, okay? Um, the, the disc and also uh, the disc with, uh, with the blades, as you can see, okay? So, um, as for the results, um, we we uh, we measured the the, dim the dimensions of the rotor in order to um, to uh, uh, compare it to the theoretical dimensions that that uh, we calculated uh, during the hydraulic design. Um, this was uh, also um, we we also had we uh, as for the conclusions um, we. Um, uh, we uh, it was shown that it it is possible to to fabricate uh, 
this kind of, of uh, road turbine rotors uh, with with recycled plastics and also um, to to uh, generate electricity with with the recycled plastics. Also, um, uh, this is a uh, an easy manufacture method to to apply in this in the, in the fabrication of this kind of turbines. And uh, also a good surface finish was obtained. However, it wasn't the the um, let's say the the optimal surface finish. And also, um, uh, according to the we, we uh, the ISO the ISO two seven six eight uh, one standard, uh, the the dimensions were were uh, really acceptable uh, for this router. So well, with this. Uh, uh, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now it's the turn of, I think, Dilollo. Yes. Sir. Study, an experimental study on the ability of aquatic vegetation to trap plastic in rivers. So by Dilollo, Galiteria, Duce, Maggi, Trombetta, e uh, Scalici. Please, Dilollo, if you can share your screen and then uh, you can start your presentation. I have to share the screen. Oh, no, okay, perfect. No, no, I'm sharing for you yeah. the screen. Okay, great. So, uh, hi all, I am Giovanni Di Lollo, PhD student at uh, Roma 3 University, Department of uh, Civil Engineering. Uh, today, I'm glad to have the opportunity to present to you this work. It is an experimental study on the ability of aquatic vegetation to trap plastic in rivers. So plastic pollution and its catastrophic effects on the ecosystem are a global environmental problem. The amount of plastic entering the aquatic environment annually ranges between 19 and 23 million tons. But these numbers are believed to underestimate the true amount of plastic in the marine river system. So every day, plastic debris of different size and composition are poured into rivers from industrial or civil waste accidentally or, uh, or not. They are then transported to, to, the leaks, to the lakes, seas or oceans, where they begin to decompose into very small pieces and are ingested by fauna or absorbed by flora. Finally, they return to the humans uh, through the food chain. In uh, the last years, uh, the idea of using vegetation has developed to limit this phenomenon. The present study experimentally analyzes for the first time the ability of submergent vegetation to entrap river in plastics. So um, our purpose is to propose a green solution to limit, to limit the plastic pollution. By increasing the presence of vegetation in rivers, a good portion of uh, the price can be blocked. Then plastics can be removed from the vegetation with an appropriate extraction or washing techniques and then proceed with a new insertion of plants into the river. The aims of this study so, is to quantify the ability of the aquatic vegetation to trap plastic and understand uh, whether different plant biotic factor, hydraulic conditions or the price type influence it. Um, two submerged macrophytes, among the most common in the Asian and European rivers, are used in this work, the Mirophilium spicatum and the Potamogetum crispus. These two species, these species uh, show a similar ecology, but different structure. The Mirophilium has a long stem with pinnate leaves, composed by numerous thread-like leaf leaflets. Potamogeton uh, instead show a flattened and branching stem with linear oblong wavy leaves. So simply put, Mirophilium has a more articulated structure with more branched and numerous uh, leaves than Potamogeton. The, um, the river is reproduced by using a recirculating flume uh, with the help of uh, two centrifugal pumps connected to a tank. It was possible to introduce a constant flow rate um, a constant flow rate into the channel. And a gate placed at the end of the channel is used to vary the uh, height of the water column, simulating different hydraulic conditions and therefore the seasonality of the river. After placing the, the plants in the channel and uh, wait for the steady condition of the flow, a known amount of plastic with different sizes are inserted in the stream. 
We use uh, macroplastics that are uh, pieces with lengths greater than two and a half centimeter, mesoplastic with lengths between half centimeter and two point half centimeter, and microplastic with length less than uh, half centimeter. The experiment were conducted by varying the type of the plant and uh, with two values of the height of the water column. Furthermore, for each configuration, three different vegetation area densities were analyzed by varying the number of the, the plant stolons, and each experiment lasts one minute. The, entrap the entrapment efficiency of the two species uh, is evaluated through the percentage of entrapment obtained from the ratio between the number of trapped fragments and the total thrown for each of the price category. As, uh, as I showed here in the poster, both, fl both plants have showed a good ability to block the transport of plastic in rivers. Mirophilium was found uh, more efficient uh, than potamogeton, especially in trapping microplastics, meaning that a more articulated structure allows for a greater trapping of small debris. A greater density of the plants leads uh, to a greater amount of uh, trapped debris. Uh, the variation in hydraulic, in a, in a hydraulic condition did not significantly influence the result. So, in uh, conclusion, this study has experimentally demonstrated that submerged vegetation can be used as a trap for plastic transported in rivers. The area occupied by plants and biotic factors such as the vegetation structure influences the trapping efficiency, while hydraulic conditions do not. For a greater understanding of this, uh, the phenomenon or the use of uh, aquatic vegetation, uh, in situ measurements are required. So thank you all for the attention. Thank you a lot for this interesting talk on, on experiments. I would like to pass it on to the next speaker, Vishal Singh Rabat, on the effects of fortnightly environmental parameters on Epsu, Koilia, Naso sketch in the Shikungo River estuary in Japan. So the screen is shared and Vishal Rahavat, you're welcome to start. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Vishal Singh Rahavat. Uh, uh, I'm from Tokyo Metropolitan University. So uh, today I'll be talking about the topic effects of four tight environmental parameters on coelinases uh, catch in the Chikungu River actually. So basically this uh, uh, research, it focuses on uh, determining the relationship between uh, Coelinesis, which is uh, it's an anadromous fish, uh, locally known as etso fish, uh, in the Chikugo River estuary. Chikugo River estuary, as you can see in the uh, in the study area, it's in the Kyushu prefecture of Japan. It's in the southern part of the Japan. So this, so what we try to do, we uh, we we got the fish catch data from a local fisherman for a period of eleven years, from two thousand nine to two thousand twenty. Uh, in, in between, uh, in 2012, there was no data of fish catch, but we were able to get uh, fish catch data in other years. So, and we also monitored uh, the environmental parameters like salinity, turbidity, temperature, water level, and uh, discharge uh, in that particular stretch. So basically, he fishes from 14.6 kilometers from the river mouth to 16 kilometers. That was his uh, fishing area, which where he used to where he used to fish. So, uh, in figure number two, you can see the temporal variations of all the environmental parameters. Yeah, so I want to, uh, I also want to say that, so fishing is allowed from uh, May 1st to July 20. So this is the allowed pe uh, fishing period. So we focused on this period for all the years. So in figure number two, you can see the temporal variations of all the environmental parameters from May 1st to May, uh, July 20. And you can see during the low discharge period, uh, that is the um, high, um, greater tidal influence can be seen, uh, which allowed uh, salt, uh, salt water intuition, which increased salinity. And also we can see during the low, uh, low flow conditions, there is a development of EDM, that is the estuary turbidity maximum. 
but during the other half after may after june or second week of the june you can see a uh, high discharge condition occurs uh, so during flood discharge conditions we can see the decrease in the salinity and the flushing of uh, and decreased uh, sse so the etm is uh, no flush flushed out so from the figure we can see that higher amount of fish catch was observed during the spring tide uh, we can see like the highest catch is corresponding to all the spring tide uh, conditions but uh, also but we can't say that okay a fish catch is only happening during the spring tide so in figure number 3 we can see the relationship between the mean tidal range so uh, we we try to distinguish different tides uh, the fortnightly variation with the tidal range that is uh, spring tide intermediate tide and neap tide with respect to the mean tidal range and we can see during the spring tidal range that uh, the mean tidal range uh, differs from 3.5 to 4 uh, almost 4.5 meters and the highest fish catch can be observed at 4 meters also we used a uh, generalized additive model uh, it's a non linear uh, model uh, uh, it's a generalized linear model sorry it's a generalized linear model to uh, to determine the relationship in a statistical way and we found out that during spring tide uh, when we check the model showed a good correlation uh, with this uh, corresponding to other other spring other tidal conditions so for the conclusion we can say that uh, environmental parameters like temperature salinity and river discharge they were they had a significant impact on the fish catch uh, high fish catch was observed corresponding to this uh, environmental parameters and also we could statistically statistically we can say that uh, high fish catch was uh, can be predicted during the spring tidal conditions that's it thank you so much Thank you very much for this presentation. Now, now I would like to check if the uh, third presenters uh, is able uh, to 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 give us his, his presentation or presentation. Uh, the title uh, Emanuele was effect yes. of hydrogenerator uh, and so on. We can check again. Is the presenter able uh, to give some words about this poster? Okay, Manuele, I suggest that we go on with the last presentation, which is yeah. the, the number one. Turbulence distribution in open channel flow with submerged flexible canopy. And, uh, yeah. The last presenter asked me if he could directly share the screen because he has modified the presentation. So it's okay for me, of course. Yeah, Gautam, you can share. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, is I am audible? Yes. And uh, my screen is visible. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Haryom Gautam, and uh, my abstract title is Turbulence Distribution in an Open Channel Flow with Some Much Flexible Codify. In this study, we investigated the turbulence distribution in open channel flow with some much flexible canopy. An experiment was conducted on a densely vegetated canopy to uh, record turbulence characteristics. So, in an open channel, uh, the presence of flexible vegetation introduces uh, additional resistance, resistance and drag to the flow, and it also reduces uh, the flow capacity of the flow and creates the complex flow structures. Uh, apart from that, it also alters the velocity profiles and turbulence characteristics in an open channel flow and resulting in the change, uh, alteration in the hydrodynamics of the flow. Uh, so thus the enhanced uh, knowledge of the turbulence distribution in an open channel flow with vegetation is uh, important uh, for the better management of the waterways and their environment. 
So for the present study, a rectangular tilting flume of 40 meter long and 0.45 meter wide is chosen for the experiment. The flow depth was uh, 21 uh, centimeter and the discharge was 32 uh, liter per second. So experiment was conducted for uh, two conditions, one for plain bed condition and another for vegetated bed conditions. So in the plate bed condition, channel bottom was smooth and uh, there is a no additional roughness in the channel bottom and uh, for the vegetated bed condition, a flexible canopy was uh, placed in the channel bottom and then the experiment was conducted. Hello. Hello. Is I'm out even? Yeah, go, go on, go on. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. So, the in the previous study, many studies, the flexible vegetation was used for the bladed shape or cylinder shape. In the present study, the uh, vegetation was artificial flexible plants of regular shape and non-uniform uh, leaf area distribution uh, was used to mimic the natural vegetation and uh, it is representing the uh, sapling uh, type of vegetation. And the length of the vegetation zone was uh, zone was, was 4.5 meter, uh, and the flexible vegetation was 7.5 centimeter height and having a frontal width of uh, 4 centimeter. Uh, the mean deflected height of the this flexible vegetation during the flow was recorded 5.5 centimeters, and the uh, uh, density of the vegetation zone was uh, <coughs> 11,000 uh, 1,111 plants per meter square. Also, the porosity of this vegetation zone was 97%, and the plant area density was 42 uh, meters square per meter cube. And uh, also, the submergence ratio, uh, which is basically the flow uh, flow depth to the vegetation height, was uh, 3.8. And uh, the Reynolds numbers are very high, so it is a kind of turbulent flow. So, the three dimensional velocity was recorded using uh, ADV uh, <coughs> to, and, uh, to measure the turbulence characteristics. So coming to the result parts, uh, the vertical distribution of uh, stream-wise uh, turbulence intensity, turbulent kinetic energy, and Reynolds shear stress for plain and uh, vegetated both uh, are compared. So in a plain bed conditions, so the, these uh, turbulence characteristics are higher near the channel bed, which is uh, equals to Z by HB is 0.2. Here, Z is the flow depth, and uh, HB is the height of the vegetation, uh, basically the deflected height of the vegetation. So, so uh, based on the flow condition, uh, we can divide the flow in a two zone. One is a upper uh, free water zone which, uh, and a lower vegetated zone. The vegetation was present. So, uh, for, so the maximum turbulence uh, parameters are recorded at the intersection of these two layers. That means at the top of the canopy. And uh, in the upper free water layer, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, turbulence was uh, decreasing towards the free water surface. And in the lower canopy layer or vegetation layer, uh, minimum turbulence recorded at the channel bed and uh, it is decreases towards the canopy top. So basically, uh, the presence of the vegetation at the channel bottom significantly alters the vegetation, uh, significantly alters the turbulence characteristic. Uh, in the figure two, these results are shown uh, like uh, turbulence intensity, turbulence kinetic energy, and uh, Reynolds shear stress. And also, uh, uh, the line showing the Z by HV is equal to 1, is, is, it is the canopy top. So we can see the uh, in the upper layer, the turbulence is uh, decreasing towards the free surface for the vegetated conditions. Uh, and it is the maximum at the canopy interface. So this, uh, to come into the conclusion part, this uh, research provides relevant understanding about turbulence distribution in uh, densely vegetated flows with high submergence ratio and having the vegetations with leafy structures, like uh, uh, not a bladed structures, but it is having the uh, uh, leafy structures. It is shown in figure one. And uh, the fluctuation uh, turbulence is high at the canopy top because the fluctuation of the plant leaf is highest at the canopy top. Uh, so this is from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, I don't know. I, I saw Emanuele that you sent a, a question on the chat. We can try for the last time uh, to call. Uh, the presenter of effects of hydro generator uh, rotor eccentricity and so on, but I don't think that uh, uh, he or she is with us because I think that you didn't uh, uh, obtain any reply. Is it correct, Emanuele? Yeah, indeed, yes. Okay. So we can go on with the questions. So, yes, we can go on with uh, a question with some questions. Uh, 
And I would like to start with the, the first questions, uh, with the first presentation, which is continuous measurements of river flow and so on. And please, uh, Emanuele, if you can uh, share again the screen. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, application uh, in field. And so I would like to ask if uh, there was the possibility to have a comparison, uh, uh, for example, in study between your uh, system and the classic system, for example, acoustic Doppler current profilers or something like that, if you have uh, uh, checked this comparison, installing your instrumentation with the a more classic instrumentation, or if you are planning to do it in the near future? Well, thank you for your question. Actually, we did a uh, lot of experiments on observations, uh, and we make comparison with it, uh, with uh, ADCP bot, and also with, with each ADCP uh, system. So the verification was very good uh, with the facts compared to the classical uh, equation, the rating curve. So, but the purpose of this application was actually because in previous research, we depends on the ADCP itself to determine the stream flow direction. So in order to obtain the direction exactly, so we depended on the ADCP. So this time in order to be uh, more independent. So I just depend uh, on the tomography itself, the path system itself. And uh, maybe also for the next, uh, research in the future so we would like also to map the 2d velocity currents using the tomography itself so this is one of the uh application that we are working on yes okay thank you just another question when you write yes. continuous measurements uh, do you mean because uh this is really a curiosity uh i think that you must have uh, uh, a discretization of the time for which you have your measurements. So, uh, how many measurements per time are you able to, to access? Yes, in the case of this, uh, this is automated the observation. So, I just set the system and then the system each 30 seconds make measurements. So, acoustic signals are transmitted through the uh, river each uh, 30 seconds and now we were able also to make it around each uh, 10 seconds this is very important because we are considering also to uh, measure in the case of uh, tsunamis occur and during typhoons flood induced by typhoons so yes continuous means that it automated and it takes uh, measurement every very high frequency so 10 seconds 30 seconds one minute and so on so do you think that it's possible to use this uh, tool, this uh, uh, way to do these measurements also to have turbulence analysis? Uh, turbulence. Uh, maybe it's possible for the future, but now um, I did not consider to be honest, but I think there is a possibility. Thank you for this point. I, I have to consider in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, do you have other questions on this presentation? On this one, not. I would, on the one hand, invite the audience okay, please. To, okay. to, to put their uh, questions just in the chat and we can see them and uh, address them to the speakers. I would like to shuffle the order a bit. And <laughs> actually, I have a, I would like to start one of my questions with the talk from Giovanni Di Lolo on the experimental study on how aquatic vegetation traps uh, plastics in rivers. So two questions. The first one would be like in your experimental setup, you poured plastic into the system and then measured how the vegetation traps those. So I would be on the one hand interested in how much plastic you poured in to get these rates and how is that reflected in and kind of plastic transportation ratios that you might see in a natural environment. So thank you for uh, for the question. Okay, the first uh, I un I understand. Uh, we use uh, uh, polystyrene um, uh, pieces of plastic. We measured uh, one gram for macro, meso, and microplastics, 
And then uh, that was really annoying for the microplastic. We count uh, all the all the pieces. So we put inside at the end of the of the channel, we have a net so we can uh, block and we so the the plastic are not going in the, in the recirculating system. And then we extracted both the plants and the net and we count uh, them by difference uh, we, we have. So we put uh, uh, just for a preliminary start because uh, we follow uh, also for the timing of the experiment. We followed other experiment on uh, marine vegetation, and they also put one gram of, uh, of plastic, and uh, the experiment least one minute. If you can repeat the second question, please. Uh, so basically, the the plastic, the amount you poured in at the top, kind of like then to create this transportation rate of plastic within the flumes. How would that relate to to it's not natural, but in a sense, if I can so call it natural plastic transportation rates or in other way, transportation rates in natural environments. Ah, be, in be, ah because we put, because uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, especially for the microplastics, yeah. that is, it will be the the topic of my, of a part of my PhD. They came out from what, from waste discharge, from industrial yeah. discharge. So I'm going to say it's simulating a little the discharging from uh, from this and then the moving along the the path of the of the river right so you would say you could the uh, the values you have on the ratio of caught plastics you could extrapolate yeah into, into real life settings okay. yes yeah. and then just out of curiosity i know it's you probably didn't measure that in your experiments but like how long would the plastic do you know if there are studies showing how long plastic would stay in plants before um, it gets more dissolved or then gets passed on or something? Um, we we didn't finish the experiment. We are doing uh, another sex of experiment that probably I will uh, present next next year and we put a uh, um, continued re release of, uh, of plastics and mm -hmm. we stop the experiment and we make another release after one minute or five minutes. And then we we will be able to count to know how much the plastic remaining trapped in uh, in the plants or moved by the the river. All right. So for now, I don't have uh, uh, enough data. I we saw with another type of plants that uh, a lot of plastic uh, also in two minutes leaves the the plant, but was a completely different macrophytes. And uh, we are waiting for the seasonality to find other plants of this type to reproduce the experiment. Okay, thank you. I thank just you. thought there's one question coming from the audience uh, regarding to asking what size of plastic can get with this vegetation? Uh... Uh, I guess it maybe refers to what size of plastic you used. Uh, yes. We we use the the three macro category of uh, of plastic. So they are we put uh, we cut this uh, cup of uh, polystyrene in uh, irregular or square uh, form. So the macro plastic, this kind of uh, the this kind of uh, macrophytes uh, catch well uh, the macro and the mesoplastic, the mirophilium, also the microplastic. So the length, the sides are about two and two point five centimeter for the macro. Between uh, we put between one and two centimeter of uh, mesoplastic, and uh, for what we can cut uh, between uh, one and five millimeter of uh, microplastic. So this plant, uh, the myriophyllum, we saw that can catch also the microplastics. We will now try also to put, uh, I'm going to say, really microplastic, so they are less than uh, one millimeter. All right. I hope I answered the yeah. question. I think that's good, yeah. And then there was one another follow-up question from, from another person asking, are the two aquatic plants common no. globally? And in the in the ocean, uh, no, I can see the the, the chat. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you for the question. Not in the ocean, uh, but what I'm I'm focusing now 
is how to block uh, the transport, the plastic before they reach the sea. So this kind of uh, of plants, of uh, this kind of aquatic plants, are uh, common in the rivers and also sometimes in the estuaries of, uh, of the river. So they can, the idea is to put this uh, vegetal barrier, that green barrier, before it reaches the, the ocean. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I pass it on to, to Michele again. Sorani, I have a question uh, for you. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, study because I know that this is one of the uh, most important topic for the pollution of uh, rivers. And I think that this could be the first step, which is the entrapping of the plastics. The second one should be the collection of this plastic. How do you think to do it? Uh, collecting the plants directly and then to do other plants or uh, uh, with uh, diverse that how do you think that you could do the second step of the collection of this plastic that have been entrapped? Okay, thank you. So uh, an idea is to uh, create this, this barrier and uh, then uh, remove the plants, often, usually. in uh, So we can collect these, washing these, and then our, my colleagues from uh, the Department of Science of Romatic University are working on washing techniques and collecting techniques. But the fact is that to take out the plants, a part, a portion of the plants, while we are inserting new, so it, it will be a cycle of uh, growing, taking, growing, and then uh, continue, continue like that. This will not block all the all the plastic for sure, but it's uh, doing like this could be a useful uh, solution. So the idea is that to take out the plants, washing and reinsert a new one, or if we can also this uh, plant that we took out. Thank you. Are there other questions on this presentation? I don't think so, and so. Uh, Daniel, if you agree, we can go on the second presentation study on aeration efficiency of Gabion Weir, mm -hmm. uh, for which I would like to know if uh, the study also involves some field uh, experiments uh, or uh, if uh, the authors are planning to do this in the near future. Hello, pardon, sir? Uh, just a curiosity, uh, did you check also uh, this efficiency of Gabion Weir uh, in uh, prototype scale or only in your laboratory? Are you planning to do further experiments uh, and uh, also in uh, field, so in the real dimensions? Sir, I have done experiments in the laboratory. Uh and made a model, uh, three models. And uh, to reduce that uh, pro pro scale effects from the, from the prototype, uh, I have done the calculations for, uh, of the non-dimensional Buckingham Pi theorems by using Buckingham Pi theorem. Okay, thank you. Daniel or also the audience uh, have other questions on this presentation? Yes, let me chip one in while we possibly 